pretend that you're hearing a gavel and we're gaveling in. So welcome to the Judiciary Committee hearing to consider two judicial nominations this afternoon at 1 p.m. in 016 and remotely. Um, my name is Carl Rhodes. I'm chair of the Judiciary Committee again. We have two new members that I'd like to welcome, uh, Senator Kahele, who will not be with us too long because he has been elected to the U.S. Congress. So congratulations to him. And also congratulations to Chris Lee, who is a longtime member of the House of Representatives and now a senator. The returning members, and congratulations to those of you who won your race just recently, Senator Kim, Senator Gabbard, Senator Favela, and Senator Kale Kaloli, the vice chair of the committee. So the two uh, nominations that are up today are governor's message and number one for Judge Todd Eddins for a term of 10 years as an associate justice of the Supreme Court. Can everybody hear me? I just want to check. Everybody good on the, yeah, okay. And then from Judiciary uh, Communication number one, Stephanie Char, for a six-year term on the District Family Court of the Fifth Circuit, which is Kauai. So I believe everyone is here. Senator Kale Kaloli via Zoom. Uh, Senator Lee in 016. Senator Gabbard. Hey, let's see. Yeah, there you are. Welcome. And um, Senator Kaheli, we already mentioned. Senator Favela. I don't see him yet, but I understand he's planning to be here. And I believe we're also joined by another new senator. Congratulations to Senator Sin, um, Joyce in Boynton Ventura. Yes, she's here uh, remotely. And here's Senator Favela in person. Okay, this meeting, including the audio and video of remote participants, is being streamed live on Facebook and on YouTube. You will find links to the live stream options on the broadcast page of the legislature's website. That's www.3w.capital.hawaii.gov slash broadcasts.aspx. I'll repeat that again, capital.hawaii.gov, broadcast.aspx. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to a major technical difficulty, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business tomorrow, Tuesday, November 7, at 1 p.m. on Zoom and in room 016 and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. Please stay with us for 20 minutes after a crash. If we can't fix the problem in 20 minutes, we'll roll till tomorrow at 1 p.m. If we only have a partial crash, or for example, if my laptop goes down, Vice Chair Kiel Kaloli will take over and continue the hearing to its conclusion. If the crash only affects one appointee, we will do everything we can to take testimony, ask testifiers questions, and we will roll that appointment to the end of the, end of the agenda to see if the technical problems can be worked out. If an appointee cuts out and the problem is fixed before the end of the agenda, I will go back to that appointee to, fin to finish up and ask the current appointee to wait. So we'll try to finish um, Judge Eddins up um, before um, Ms. Char if, if that situation occurs. For the people testifying, participating remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and the video disabled until it's your turn to testify. There's a two minute limit on oral testimony. We have your written testimony and we have read it, all of it. If there are temporary technical glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints, but we will try to get back to you if we can fix it, the problem. Um, so members, normally we wait till the end of the testifiers to ask questions, um, but because of the remote, test, the remote nature of the testimony, we're going to go ahead and ask questions immediately after the two minutes of testimony is over. And this way, testifiers don't have to hang around if they don't want to, and we'll only have to patch them in once to avoid uh, technical difficulties. Uh, for the written testimony, I'll be reading the names of people who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize if the closed captioning does not accurately transcribe the names. If you're interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the second special session page on the legislature's website, which is capital.hawaii.gov, as I mentioned before. The committee will not be voting today. The committee will vote will be on Wednesday, November 18 at 10.30 a.m. on Zoom and in room 016. Regardless of the vote in committee, all appointees will get a full Senate vote, which will occur on at the Thursday, November 19th floor session that's scheduled to start at 11.30 p.m. Okay, I believe that's it. Any members, members, any questions at this point? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and move on into the first nominee, which is um, 
Todd Eddins for a, for a term of 10 years as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. First up on the testifier list is Maria Roth Tijerina, and I believe she's here remotely. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Hello. Thank you for, thank you for attending. Oh, I'll get a chance, so I better talk back. On the day the man who repeatedly sexually assaulted my six-year-old daughter was to be punished, Judge Evans threw out the free to plea plea deal because the defendant asked him to. Next, Evans denied the only request for delay by the prosecution because a vital witness, the doctor who examined, questioned, and administered the rape kit, would be out of town, a very important witness. Then he ordered the child victim to have to be subject to an unwarranted competency hearing before he would even let the case go to trial. During this hearing, Ennis allowed the defense to engage in an accusatory and aggressive line of questioning that left the child victim shaking and soaked in tears, to which his only reaction was to throw out my sister, the only family member allowed to be in court with her because my daughter made eye contact with her. Evans participated in what was nothing short of psychological warfare upon the child victim. As if that wasn't enough, he then denied me the right to read a victim impact statement on behalf of my daughter, justifying his actions by saying things like, I've already read it so we can skip that part. It's too political because I had the gall to mention me too in it. And then after he tried to censor what I was allowed to say, he constantly interrupted and cut off my statements before I could finish, violating the Judicial Code of Conduct Rule 2.6, ensuring the right to be heard, along with promoting the confidence in judi the judiciary, because every move he made was to the unfair advantage of the defense sparking public outrage. Evan should have never presided over any case in which a guilty verdict would re the result in the defendant having to register as a sex offender. As he has openly showed his bias in such cases and his overwhelming concern for the well-being of child, child predators, being the only attorney to challenge the Hawaii sex offender registry, claiming it was unconstitutional and compared it to a modern discarded letter, portraying the image of two lovers cruelly ripped apart and punished too harshly by a prudish society, while describing a case in which his 36-year-old client was found guilty of repeatedly having sex with a five-year-old little girl. Placing Eddins on the Supreme Court would have diacrisis to all children. He really doesn't care about anyway. Okay, Ms. Roth, Tijerina, your two minutes are up, so could you please wrap it up at this point? We have I'm done. We, you're done. Okay, thank Everything you very much. Everything else I've already sent to you, all the proof of his extremist comments, everything you already have proof of. It's on videotape. Okay. So, yeah, I'm done. Okay. Members, any questions for Ms. Roth, Tijerina? Senator Kim, is that a no? Yes? Yes, uh, I believe ahead, also, Senator Kim. also Senator um, Joy also have uh, her hand up, but I'll go ahead and sit. Um, thank you very much for testifying. Uh, this agreement or plea, was it something that you had, um, I'm sorry, plea agreement that you had agreed to? Or no. no, I was emotionally blackmailed into it the day after she left the unnecessary um, competency hearing for the child victim. And I reached out to the prosecutor's office that same day and said, I don't want to take the case. And I let Judge Evans know I didn't want this plea agreement. I did not agree to it. Okay, so you never... In the statement, he did not let me read in court. So you never agreed to the plea agreement at any given time? No, there's nothing ever. There's no signature, nothing. I never agreed to it. I was sitting there getting mad around by the defense, saying that I would be an unfit mother, how Evans would allow my child to be psychologically permanently damaged, being questioned like that for three hours, blah, blah, blah. And then I called her back within the hour, and I'm like, oh, my God, is this what I should do? Am I really hurting my child this much? And then I called back within the hour, and I said, no, I don't want to. And this was in the evening and she's like oh too bad i already sent it off i never agreed to that thank you okay um my last question and that you're fully aware of that okay. my last question is you stated that you were not allowed to read a statement at the no. end was it you who wanted to read the statement excuse me you you testified saying that uh, the judge never allowed you to read a testament uh, read a statement at the end. Is that correct? You, you were going to read a statement? Yeah, I was going to read a statement and then he said, we don't have to read it in court because I, he already read the statement, so there's no need for me to have to read it in court. 
Yeah. You're so it was you that it? was going to read the statement and not a family member or somebody else? No, I was too shaken up to physically read the statement. So I had my best friend standing up reading it for me. I was right there. Okay, but you weren't, you weren't going to read the statement. It was your friend that was going to read the statement. Read my statement, yes. Okay, thank the you. The statement very much. I wrote on behalf of my daughter. Thank you. Uh, Senator San Buenaventura, you had a question? Yes, thank, thank you, Chair. Go ahead. You need to talk a little louder. Or okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Just barely. Okay, I'm going to yell more. Okay. Um, so, so um, Ms. Roth Tijerina, I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. You're fine. Okay. Um, so, let me just tell you a little bit about my background. I do some criminal defense from Hilo, and usually, like um, for plea agreements, the prosecutor, at least in Hilo, I don't know about Honolulu, would talk to the victims and would have a victim's assistance counselor assigned so that at the time of the plea agreement, before they send it out to the judge, they usually tell the judge that they talk to the victim and the victim agrees. Did that happen in your case? Did, was there a victim assistance counselor assigned to you? The victim, my original victim is counselor. Um, she actually told me she was not going to advocate for me because she didn't like my personal attorney, Miles Briner. And then after she was fired from the prosecutor's office, they didn't give me another victim um, person until the day before, like the week before my trial. So then I went an entire over a year without even having a victim advocate. And the victim advocate called on the line with Rochelle while she was battering me down, saying that I would be a bad mom just to have to submit my child to Judge Eden's courtroom. So so the victim counselor was the one who was battering you down? No, Ms. Rochelle Vendika was. Who was that? I'm sorry. The prosecutor, the prosecuting attorney, Rochelle Vendika. Okay, so the, so the prosecuting attorney was battering you down to try to get you to agree to the plea agreement? Is that yes, what happened? Exactly. Okay, okay. Okay, so um, did you make a complaint about the deputy prosecutor? Yes, who actually, battered you down? I, yes, you can talk to Steve All. Um, I let him know everything that she did. I sent him video documents, everything. I had made a complaint. Forgive me not for not going to Tommy Shiro. He wasn't exactly trustworthy to do the right thing. Do you know whether or not Judge Eddins know that you were battered down by the deputy prosecutor? Yes, he does. I put everything about that in the victim impact statement that he did not allow me to read. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Members, any other questions for this testifier? I uh, I can't see all the, it doesn't look like it. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Roth Tijerina. Um, you, you're welcome to stay on if you like. The, the, they'll black out your uh, face and your turn off your mic, but if other if members have questions later for you, you might want to stay around, but otherwise you're free to go. I'll be here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up we have um, Warren Wickman in support. Port, and I think he was scheduled to testify, but I don't see him on testifying uh, orally, but I don't see him on the list. So anyway, he's in support. Uh, next is Alan Komagome, also in support. Anna Ishikawa Jackson in support. Bart Nakamoto in support. And from here on out, there are no, well, there's one more person who's, who's signed up to testify um, remotely, but all the rest are um, just written testimony. Benjamin Ignacio in support, Bernie Burvar in support, Blake Bushnell in support, Bradley Chong in support, Brooke Hart in support, Catherine Gutierrez in support, Charles Crean in support, Chase Livingston in support, Chris Phillips in support, Colin Marty Fritz in support, Kristen Glenn, Crystal Glendon in support, Cynthia Wong in support, Dale Matisse in support, Daniel Foley in support, Daniel Fong in support, David Callies in support, David Hayakawa in support, David W. Lowe, 
in support, Dennis Potts in support, Terry Kobayashi in support, Diane Ono in support, Eden Elizabeth Hefo in support, Edward Aquino, Emmanuel Guerrero, Eric Higashihara all in support, Franklin Don Picaro Jr. in support, Harry Freitas, Radius in support, Hazel Bay in support, Howard Luke in support, Jack Schwager in support, Jackie Esser in support, um, the Department of Transportation, the State Department of Transportation in support, James Peach in support, James Rouse in support, uh, James Tabe in support, Jeff Ono in support, Jeffrey Ng and Jennifer Ng in support, Jeffrey Sia in support, Jerry Hyatt in support, Jill Nunokawa in support, Jim Bickerton, John, John Schmidke Jr. In, both in support, Joseph Model in support, Kaylin Iwashita in support, Catherine Katoa in support, Keith Shigatomi in support, Ken Chung in support, Kimu in support, Christy Lynn Suzuki in support, Kurt Nakamatsu in support, Kyle Dowd in support, Lars Isaacson in support, uh, Le Leali Itagupa in support, Leighton Hara in support, uh, Leslie Kobayashi in support, Linda Casey Luke in support, Lowell Kurashige in support, Lyle Hosoda, my former employer and the, the man who's really responsible for being, me living in Hawaii at all in support, Lyndon Makohara in support, Mark Davis in support, Matt Levi in support, Matthew Winter in support. Maureen King in support, Michael Healy in support, Michael Livingston in support, Michael Town in support, Nathan Notori in support, Nicole Sarn or Sarna in support, Oki Amadi in support, Peter Thompson in support, Reginald Yee in support, Richard Hope Jr. in support, Richard Stacy in support, Robert Mash in support, Robin Estrada in support, Ronald Ogomori in support. Ryan Markham in support, Seth Friedman in support, Stephen Tevis in support, Steve Goodnow in support, Stephen Nichols in support, Stuart Tanimoto in support, Susan Utsugi in support, Susan Wan in support, Taryn Tomasa in support, Terry uh, Riviere, or Rivere, Revere in support, Timothy Ho in support, Walter Rodby in support, Wendy Hudson in support, William Harrison in support, David Ann, David Van Acker in support, Eric Arasato in support, Melissa Enright and Christian Enright in support. And now we're to the Hawaii State Bar Association, Gregory Fry, uh, with comments, and I think he's here. I am, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I'll just take a couple of, uh, about a minute of your time, and that's it. Thank you. Please um, proceed. Thank you. Thank you all for allowing me to spend a few moments with you. Uh, part of my job and probably the most celebrated part in my mind is to be able to spend many hours with the nominees as they come up uh, the process and then ultimately come before you, an essential committee that decides whether they should or should not be seated. Um, spending time with Judge Eddins was an absolute privilege and honor. He is an attorney that started his career in the courtroom helping the people that need the most help in our state, the Public Defender's Office, anyone who litigates. And Chair Roach, you just spent a considerable long period of time listing some of the most famed litigators in our state. Know of Judge Eden's talents, know of his ability to not only walk the walk, but truly talk the talk in his skills and abilities. That allowed him to rise, rightly so, and I think so many people are telling you this, uh, rightly so to the circuit court. As a circuit court judge, Judge Eddins has literally cleared his courtroom, and as a circuit judge has fully litigated to resolution more cases in his time than any other judge during that same period of time. He works tirelessly. Although a family man, 
with a large and very close family, including his parents. He continues to devote his time to public service. He will be an absolute shining star on our highest court. And while we don't speak of youth, there's no denying that he will have a decades long career helping to shape the law of our state. And I'll leave you with this one point. He is a free thinker. He is leveraged by nobody except the law and what he believes is correct under the law. And again, um, I, as I said in my test, written testimony on behalf of this association, we find him qualified and urge this committee uh, to place him on our highest court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, members, we'll go ahead and, and any, any uh, questions for uh, uh, Mr. Fry? Uh, okay, I don't, I don't hear or see anyone who wants to ask a question. Mr. Fry, do you have a question for you? So just remind us, remind the committee what the, uh, the levels of qualification are. Is it, as I recall, it's, there's just two unqualified and qualified, is that correct? Correct, we've had a varying history over time, Mr. Chair, but currently it is qualified and unqualified and no other designations. Can you tell us just a little bit about the process that HSBA goes through again, the, the, what all do you look at? Thank you. Uh, we have our own application, which mirrors in many, many respects the Judicial Selection Commission application. And after that is filled out by the nominee, I appoint or the, the president appoints a three person committee, a subcommittee. That subcommittee reviews very closely the application and the materials submitted and most closely every referral that is written. The three members of the subcommittee contact and part out every referral and calls each one in hopes to contact and reach each one and go through our criteria uh, in terms of knowledge, in terms of work, in terms of opinion, and in terms of basic information, puts that all into writing into a written summary report. They also review the invitation to the entire Hawaii State Bar Association membership uh, to write in by email, confidential, if anyone chooses to do so and ranks those opinions, those comments, whether they be negative, whether they be neutral, whether they be positive. The com subcommittee then meets with the entire board and summarizes their findings in a written report. The day before that meeting, myself and our executive director meets with the nominee, in this case, Judge Eddins, speaks with him about the process being the next day where after the board is briefed by the subcommittee, the board is meets with the nominee, in this case, Judge Eddins. Judge Eddins opens with comments and opening statement, if you will. Each committee member, much like here, is given an opportunity uh, and board member is given an opportunity to question the nominee, ask any questions necessary, and then immediately thereafter, a written vote uh, is taken and then reported to me later in the day, at which time I call the nominee with the findings. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, members, let's go to question. Senator Favela, I see your hand up, go ahead. Okay, I'm just listening to uh, a list of criteria that you have. Um, it would be um, hard for me not to sit and ask this question. Knowing that this uh, parent, this mom, that had maybe had these complaints put in, um, at any time during this um, list of criteria and stuff that you guys are going through, did any one of you guys look into this case and see there was any improprieties of, uh, of handling this case. I mean, because 
um, you know, I know you guys probably got the same email that I got, um, just reading it and whatnot. So I just want to have another point of view since you guys have such a big list of criteria. Um, did any one of you or any one of the people on this panel um, ever um, really looked into this case? Look into it? I would have to say no beyond the four corners of the written information which was provided to us. Um, Senator, no, we didn't go independently and do fact finding. We spoke of it. Um, we evaluated it. It became part of our voting process. But if anything by way of additional legs or additional independent investigation, the board did not do so. The three-person committee um, gleaned from what was provided and then gave us the highlights, but nothing beyond that. Thank you. Follow-up. Follow-up. Yeah, Hank, are you done? Is that your, was that it? Uh, oh, Senator yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, Senator Donna has something to say. Okay, go ahead, Senator Kim. Just a follow-up, Mr. Frey. Uh, is that a normal procedure when you have uh, somebody in strong opposition that you folks do not look into it further other than what you said? Interesting. I would have to say, and maybe this is when you wish you had the one-armed lawyer so we wouldn't always say on the one hand this and on the one hand that, I would have to say it would depend. Some folks who bring criticism, who bring aggressive opinion uh, uh, to the negative, will provide us with lots of material and ask to talk with us directly. If that happens, then yeah, we would be more involved and have been more involved. In this case, we did not do that. So I'd have to answer your question by saying it's a case by case um, circumstance. Yes, we have been more involved in issues. We've even had some folks who wanted to be identified, wanted to come before the three person committee, wanted to come to the board meeting to discuss directly. Sometimes it depends on the person bringing the information and how involved they wish to be. Thank you for that. So in this case, Ms. Roth Tiharina did not uh, ask to come before you, um, didn't, was not somebody that wanted to do more than just submit written testimony because she's obviously sent us emails. She can't, she's here, um, you know, uh, by Zoom to testify and she seems to be very passionate. So I'm wondering, uh, was, was she not aware that she could do that? I can't speak for what she was aware of, Senator. Uh, I know that this committee has all of its opportunity to question her and to talk to her as she sits here today with her passion and with her delivery. As it related to my board or the HSBA board and the subcommittee, we did not have that degree of contact directly with her or request to the same regard that she appears to be putting forth today uh, with this committee. Okay. And finally, was, was the applicant, uh, the nominee, ever questioned about uh, what, what she had submitted? Not by me personally, no. How about the other members? The subcommittee, I believe, and maybe the, uh, Judge Edmonds will be able to tell you this, but the subcommittee did have discussion with uh, the judge about this issue, as far as I know. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Members, any other question, questions for this testifier? Uh, okay, I, if, I think I'm looking at all the things I'm supposed to be looking at, the chat and the raised hands and everything, but if, if you want to say something, butt in, because I can't, I can't see quite as well as I normally can from uh, my perch in the middle of this table there. Um, okay, thank you, Mr. Fry. And uh, we will go ahead and move on to, uh, does anybody else, did, Senator Kim, did you want to go back and ask uh, Ms. Roth, any further questions? She's still here if you, if you wanted to ask her. 
Yeah, why don't I get, you know, do that okay. right now? <clears throat> Go ahead. Hi, Miss Ralph. Do you, do yes, you hear me now? I'm here. Can you hear me? Were you ever um, told you could appear before the board? Um, I didn't actually know the, that board existed. What board is I went to the neighborhood board trying to speak to Carl Rose last week. I didn't, I would have gone to any board that I knew existed. I had no idea of this board. What was it called? It, it's the, um, the, um, ju judicial, judicial. Well, it's the Hawaii State Bar Association. Oh, Bar Association. Um, yeah. yeah, and then they have a committee. Yeah. Well, I actually reported this to the Hawaii State Bar Association last year when it happened, and I got no response from them. Um, that's the only way, and I had no idea that their committee was part of this process, or else I would have gone back to them again. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, members. Any other questions for either of the two people here t testifying remotely? Okay, seeing and hearing none, uh, 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 Judge Edens, if you'd like to make an opening statement, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Senator Rose and Judiciary uh, Committee members, Senator Kochi and uh, Senate members. Respectfully, I want to acknowledge and thank the many people who've been instrumental um, to me sitting here today. Started with my beautiful wife, Rowena, and my four uh, children, Noah, Miranda, Roscoe, and Ruby. I just have a fabulous, supportive family. You know, this is a demanding profession, uh, and they just fill my life uh, with joy. Uh, they ground me in the things that really matter. You know, in court, you know, people are required to listen to me. They're required to address me. But, you know, I go home, nobody listens to me. Nobody addresses me unless uh, their battery or their electronic device is being charged. But, you know, I just, I just love my family, and they've been so supportive over the years. And, and it's tough to, to um, tolerate long hours and, and people being away uh, from their family. But they've just been... Oh, wonderful. Um, uh, and they're really a credit to my wife. Uh, she has uh, just raised them along with me uh, to just be wonderful kids. Uh, my son, Noah, shout out to him. It's 2.40 in Bahrain right now. He's serving our country, and I know he's watching. So I love you, Noah. Um, I want to thank my parents, Nancy and Weldon Eddins. You know, I had just the prototypical classic uh, 1970s, early 80s upbringing on the windward side. Uh, it was really uh, just a wonderful upbringing. My mother was a DOE teacher. My father worked for the Department of Defense. And they raised uh, my sister, Beth Ann, who lives in, in Boston now with her husband, Lou, and, and me in just a, just a great way. And we try to instill the same values uh, in, in our children uh, that we have. I want to thank my in-laws, Alan Rose Sabangan, uh, best in-laws in the world. Uh, my sister, uh, my uh, wife's husband, uh, or my wife's brother Warren, and her, and his um, wife Jeannie, and my extended Filipino family. Uh, thank you all for your support throughout the years. I know you're itching for a big celebration, but we have to wait. Uh, I want to really extend my appreciation to Governor Ige. Uh, you know, he altered the trajectory of my professional life not once, but now twice, and his confidence in my legal abilities and. Uh, my ability to rise to the occasion and step into this position. Uh, I'm just, it, it's just really, really special. And he has spent the time and energy on many, many judicial appointments and thoroughly uh, looking and considering these appointments. And myself and my fellow third branchers really marvel at, at his efforts. He sits down with us and all the possible nominees and, and he's not a trained lawyer, but he sits down and, and listens to us and really takes these judicial appointments with the utmost seriousness. And I appreciate his, his, his confidence in me. And I also appreciate similarly the confidence the Judicial Selection Commission uh, has, um, has in me. And Chair Ronnie Kalamori, Ronnie Kalakami, and, um, and her members both presently and in the past um, have just been 
tremendous. Uh, they do a wonderful job. There's been a lot of really good quality experience judges who've retired in the past few years. There's just been an influx of openings and, and you folks with your advice and consent have seen it. There's been a lot of, of judicial openings. And I'm, I'm proud that I was among the second group of uh, appointees by Governor Ige, but really the Judicial Selection Commission with Chair Kawakami has worked in overdrive uh, really over the past several years and has really served our, our community well uh, with their efforts. I want to thank Senator Kochi for his, his positive tone when I initially uh, met with him. And, you know, it's, and, and many of us in the judiciary really appreciate when he, he comes down to the Supreme Court uh, during our, our ceremonies when, when new judges are installed. And it, it means a lot. He, he's always so witty. Uh, it's, it's just a, a pleasure to listen to him, and I, and I thank him. And I also want to thank the senators who I've, I've met with, uh, who have been generous with their, their time. You know, we've masked a mask, Zoom, phone calls. Uh, it's really been um, uh, engaging uh, to, to share with you uh, visions and views. And, and I know everybody has the, the best interest of the state at heart, as does the judiciary. And I thank you for our meetings. So I, I want to thank the HSBA and uh, President uh, Fry and uh, Executive Director Pat Maushimizu for all their efforts uh, as, as well uh, during these processes. Uh, you know, they do a lot for our legal community and, and our society as a whole. Uh, and, 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 and I appreciate them doing uh, the deep dive into uh, my qualifications. I want to really thank my friends from you know the educational institutions that I've uh, attended and Channel Lake Elementary School, Hawaii Baptist Academy, the College of William and Mary and the Rich William S. Richardson School of Law. You know I've met friends for life. I had wonderful teachers, wonderful professors. Uh, it's just you know been, been my educational experience and the people I've met along this path have been tremendous. I want to thank the friends of, of all my four children. You know all the activities uh, that I've met. My, my children range from age 23 to eight and, and all the people I've met through them, just good fun uh, people that I've, uh, you know, have, have enriched my life as well. As all my normal friends from all my regular activities, you know, my all walks of life friends, the friends that, hey, I, I didn't know you were a, a lawyer until they saw me on TV and I didn't know you were a judge you know, until they saw me on TV. It's just, you know, all, all the people who impacted my life, I really appreciate it. Uh, and especially the friends I've connected to um, with the law. You know, I love the law, and, and I, I, I love this profession. And it's, it's for 30 years I've lived and breathed the law. You know, it, this is an apprentice-like profession where, where, where it's on-the-job training, really. I mean, you, you can't read books. You can't listen to lectures. You actually have to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think people really consider me a hokey type of guy. They might consider me a dorky guy. Um, and, and it might be hokey, it might not, but, you know, when I've been thinking collectively, you know, over the past, you know, few months about this, the metaphor that really comes to mind is Hillary Clinton's, it, 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 it takes a village. And, and it really does. I've been helped along the way uh, by just so many individuals. They've maximized my legal abilities, my skill sets. They've inspired me. I've had so many influencers. And it really began... Uh, with my first job out of law school with Justice Yoshimi Hayashi of the Hawaii Supreme Court. Just an absolute gentleman. Uh, he was the first United States uh, attorney of Japanese American descent and really sort of took me under his wing, uh, showed me, uh, every, you know, tried to impart upon to me everything he learned and just a calm, unflappable uh, man. And, and I, you know, over the years, I can remember conversations between various people and I do remember uh, almost precisely a conversation I had with him. And he said, you know, Todd, you can't just be an egghead. You gotta get trial experience. And, and well, I didn't consider myself an egghead. I kinda, you know, steamed a little bit about that. But, you know, I, I did take that to heart. And then my first job, uh, instead of going to some, some of the firms uh, in town was to uh, work for the Office of the Public Defender. And I was fortunate to get a job there. And the person who hired me was Richard Pollack. He's the justice that um, I have the opportunity of, of replacing, and um, and it's an honor to replace uh, him. He, he he served our our state with such distinction. His judicial output uh, is incredible, and just just a, a, a good man. Um, I um, am tickled uh, to follow him, but not only him, 
because this seat, you know, when you trace the lineage, it goes back to really some eminent jurists uh, that have served our state. Uh, before him was Justice James Duffy, who was just a spectacular jurist. And before him, this seat was uh, Justice uh, Ramil, who also served our, our state with distinction. And even before him was Justice uh, Wakatsuki, who I had the pleasure when I was working with Justice Hayashi to, to interact with. So it's just such an honor to have this type of lineage. I want to thank all my friends from the Public Defender's Office as a young lawyer. These are, these are friends for life. They helped me uh, um, along the path. And, and also the prosecutors who I, you know, were, were on opposing sides with in the adversarial system. And, you know, we would scrap in court and, and fight for, for our various interests. But once we left the courtroom, it's handshakes and it's good relationships. And, and I want to thank them for, for um, what they um, brought to me. Uh, when I left the public defender's office, I wanted to explore the, the whole wide legal world. You know, I wanted to uh, learn civil litigation. I wanted to practice in the federal courts. I wanted to practice in our neighbor island courts. Uh, and, and that's what I set out to do. I established a, a law office with my longtime friend, Bradley Chong, who, who also just, I want to thank him uh, tremendously for all his efforts. He was the first person I actually met in law school uh, at the bookstore at UH. And, um, and my experience then as is, is the lawyer learning the ropes um, was tremendous because everybody was there to help me. The, the plaintiff's bar, the, the, the defense bar, the federal system and the federal PDs and the federal ASUAs, assistant U.S. attorneys, the federal judges, the state judges, everybody I came into contact to was just so um, considerate and, and, and willing to, to share with me uh, their knowledge. And I soaked it up. Right? I, I, you know, I, I, I've learned from lawyers of all stripes. I've, I've, I've been in virtually every courtroom in this state and dealt with um, lawyers just across the board and I have you know sat in depositions uh, for, uh, for for hours and hours and you know aside from people just giving me advice just learning from them and the way individuals conducted themselves has just been tremendous I had the opportunity to work with the late Gary Gallagher and Diane Ono uh, when they um, had me join their law firm they uh, asked me to do so and that was an incredibly rewarding uh, experience representing Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard workers and Navy veterans uh, and really uh, learning complex civil litigation. My complex litigation skills on the civil side just accelerated with my work from the firm. And it wasn't just members of the firm, but it was the top-notch uh, defense counsel uh, that I interacted with uh, on a daily basis. Really, Hawaii is really fortunate to have such strong good attorneys that represent their clients um, uh, in, in, in such a such a tremendous way. And, and I'm really grateful for the knowledge that uh, attorneys on the opposite side um, shared with me. I want to thank all the retired judges um, that I, I was before I came before, you know, the integrity and the compassion and the diligence and, and what they did for our state was just Tremendous. I mean, I would spend hours just sitting in a courtroom, you know, watching and observing and really just soaking up knowledge. I want to really thank uh, them for all their, their efforts. The federal bench that we have is, is, is really a premier federal district court uh, in our nation. And Hawaii is really fortunate to have a federal bench that's so solid and strong. And I want to thank all my um, all the people that I interacted with, the federal judges and, 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 and all the staff. And, and everybody who helped accelerate my skills on, on that level in the federal scene. Um, I really want to thank my 8th Division staff, Christy Suzuki and Alice Hoffman, who just retired. Uh, really, you know, my success is a product of my staff's hard work. Um, they did everything to keep up with me um, to um, accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. And, you know, without them, we wouldn't have been able to, to succeed as we did and for that matter the judiciary as a whole every employee on the judiciary uh, really uh, helps the the law in the community and it's really the guts and the unsung heroes of the judiciary workers that that really serve our, our third branch 
Uh, for all the lawyers who appeared before me, the public defenders, the deputy prosecuting attorneys, uh, I, I, I appreciate all their efforts and their hard work. And I'll say this about the prosecution office. You know, there was not, they were working under the less ideal situations, you know, with the cloud uh, over them and everything. But I tell you what, these were prosecutors who came in uh, with professionalism and diligence and performed their jobs under difficult circumstances uh, in a really, really fine professional way, as did the public defenders and the private attorneys that uh, were before me. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of our third branch. I mean, we have dedicated, committed, smart people who make weighty, tough, difficult decisions on a daily basis. We have good hearts and good intentions, and the judiciary tries to do its best under, under difficult times. And, you know, judging is a team sport. And all the judges here have helped me um, to become a better judge. And, and we all share a vision of fair play and justice and commitment to our community. And I really want to thank my, my fellow third branchers. You know, the, the pandemic um, has, has not slowed down legal disputes. It's not stopped crime. It hasn't caused our inventory of cases to disappear. And in fact, um, it will likely place a huge strain with uh, additional legal disputes that we don't even contemplate uh, on our system. But I tell you what, our judiciary has gone to the battle stations. Our judiciary has stepped up. We've rised to the challenge. And, and it starts from the top with Chief Justice Rechtenwald and all our chief administrative judges. Um, um, on the Second Circuit, Judge Bisson from Maui, the Third Circuit, Judge Kim uh, on Hawaii Island, and the Fifth Circuit, Kauai, uh, Judge Valenciano, and here on Oahu, uh, Judge Browning, and the Chief Judges, Judges Castagnetti, Kawamura, Kuriyama, and May, have all really stepped up and, and provided tremendous leadership uh, for us. The judiciary really has a can-do versus a can't-do attitude, and it's really started from those individuals uh, that I that I mentioned, and they've helped me along the way as well. I really do think the judiciary is a jewel of our state. Uh, we have a desire to make society work and, and function the way it should, and I think Hawaii really is lucky to have such hardworking, dedicated individuals. Um, you know, I've spent my adult life in the courtroom or preparing to be in the courtroom. Um, this is an incredibly humbling capstone to a very gratifying career as a trial judge, a trial lawyer and a circuit court judge. And I am just overwhelmed by the well wishes and the kind words and the support and the texts and the calls. It's, it's been really heartening. I think people who know me know that I, I, I kind of would feel a little more comfortable being roasted. Um, but this has just been really, really chicken skin. In fact, it's chicken skin to the max. Uh, I, I almost feel like I am um, permanently afflicted with chicken skin. I really appreciate the magnitude and the solemnity of this position. And I, and I wanna thank everyone who's helped me reach this moment. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, questions? So, Senator San Buenaventura, go ahead. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Judge. Um, when we talked, uh, when I interviewed you prior to this hearing, I talked to you about my concern about the, the delays in the appellate system. And in the event you get confirmed, Will I hear a commitment from you to expedite your decisions, especially for, and I understand that it's not only gonna come from you, but it's also gonna come from the rest of the justices, but we, um, especially when we have huge cases like Mauna Kea, we really cannot have huge delays that basically takes our community into hostage. Will I have that kind of commitment from you should you be confirmed? You know, the expeditious resolution of cases uh, has such an important impact on, on the parties and the litigants. And, and all judges strive, and in fact, it's part of the judicial code, 
uh, that we have to have prompt and efficient administration of justice. And for good reason, because people are relying on us. So I have always operated on the presumption that justice needs to be dispatched reasonably and promptly and efficiently. And that's how I've operated my, my courtroom. I, I rule on the spot. I don't take matters under advisement. I'll later reconsider matters, but uh, I, I, anybody who knows me knows that uh, we move cases. Uh, as far as the appellate level, um, you know, there, there, I think there's, there, there's criticism of the backlog of cases that goes back to, a, I think, a judicial report from 2003. So this is somewhat of a long-standing problem. Um, um, I'm not sure what the, the current state of, of any backlog is, um, but I will work collaboratively with the fellow justices and ensure, or try to ensure, that things and matters of importance, such as all the legal disputes up there, uh, are um, um, completed with efficiency and promptly. So in that sense, Senator, yes, you have my commitment to do everything within my power to facilitate uh, expeditious resolution of cases. And, and, and I want to thank you for that. And uh, basically, like I had shared with you my history and that I have taken cases up to the Hawaii Supreme Court. I've had reversals of um, I have won my, my petitions, my writs of certiorari, so I am really cognizant as to how the Hawaii Supreme Court works. But I also do know that even Manini cases takes like over a year sometimes for decisions. And e but when, we, um, when we've had legislatively had some statutes where certain cases go directly up to the Hawaii Supreme Court, bypassing the ICA. I guess we really want you folks to expedite, and even if it's not a written opinion, at least um, a memorandum opinion so that parties can move on, will, um, will really help the community at large. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Senator Favela, go ahead. Senator Gabbard, you can go. I'll wait for Senator Gabbard to finish. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Go ahead, Senator Gabbard. I didn't see you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Judge Edens, in 1998, uh, you challenged the Hawaii sex offender registration law uh, in your defense of a man who was had served 15 years in prison for raping his then girlfriend's five-year-old daughter and then after he got out he didn't notify authorities that he had moved his where he was living to a different location and you said and i quote it amounts to the modern day equivalent of a scarlet letter unquote so my question is what is your current position on the sex offender registration and notification law thank you senator gabbard you know when I was at the public defender's office. It was um, a plum assignment to challenge the constitutionality of a law with such structure in the Hawaii sex offender law. And you're right, the, the law went into effect in 97 and it was litigated in 98. So I was tasked with uh, challenging the law. And in that advocacy, um, I did challenge the law. Uh, Perhaps not, <laughs> I wasn't a good advocate because the law is constitutional and I was unsuccessful. Um, but you know, it's really important when, when, when you have laws, especially like that, 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 that things are tested. I mean, that's the way our constitutional system works is uh, to test the constitutionality of laws. And that's what I did uh, back in 97. Now, clearly me being unsuccessful uh, mean that this law is implemented. It is the law of the state. And as the law of the state, as any law, any judge has to follow the law. We don't make laws, we follow the laws. And we base our decisions on the law. So clearly an advocacy point that I made as a public defender 23 years ago has no bearing 
whatsoever on my belief as the constitutionality of the law. And in fact, once the Supreme Court made decisions rejecting my arguments, quite frankly, those were quite reasonable and um, understandable decisions that I had no beef with because it was correct. The prosecution's arguments swayed them. The prosecution's arguments were absolutely correct. And that's the law of the state, and I follow all laws of the state. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Favela, I think you're next. Yeah, I, I guess, um, I mean, we, we kind of heard um, Maria's story, and we got, all got the email. Um, and I, I just would, um, I guess at this time, I mean, I don't know if you can or, or you able to, but um, that's what, um, when I was going to have my face-to-face -face interview with you, I wanted to discuss this because after getting the email, I reached out to pretty much everybody that I could to get a consensus, but the bottom line is that, you know, you got to hear two sides of the coin. So. Um, I guess this is kind of like, I guess, your opportunity to kind of make me understand um, what I read and uh, what I um, so-called half interpreting right now on the, you know, five-year-old uh, girl and a 36-year-old man. Um, you know, that, 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 that case that was just, um, the mom was just talking about, um, I, I need a little bit more clarity on, on, on what had happened. Sure, Senator. Um, you know, let, let me just say this. Is, you know, courtrooms are fraught with highly emotionally charged matters on a daily basis. Uh, things are tense. There's emotional situations, and in particular, cases of this nature. And judges uh, understand that. And, and, you know, in our adversarial judicial system, uh, judges make decisions. Um, and parties, by the nature of our adversarial system, uh, parties feel wounded. So it's perfectly understandable um, this mother's um, position. Uh, and I certainly understand that. Uh, the Judicial Code 2.10e uh, does permit me, because some of the matter is the public record that I do recall, and it is something that I can share with you. So in answer to your question, I will shed light on the reality of what transpired uh, in this case. Uh, essentially, it boils down to this. Is I adhered to a Rule 11 plea agreement between the prosecution with the mother's consent and the defense. And the backdrop to that a plea agreement was this, is the plea agreement occurred after I crammed my courtroom with approximately 70 to 75 jurors. It was a special panel of your citizens of the United States, residents of Hawaii. Um, because of the nature of the crime, we had a larger jury panel to select individuals who can be fair and impartial and decide the case solely on the evidence. We had a full day of jury selection, the prosecution and the defense selecting a jury. We got a jury, 12 individuals who, despite the nature of the crime, uh, could be fair and impartial. We had two alternates. I swore the jury in. Double jeopardy attaches at that moment. The next day, uh, we had an off day. That's when I, I do my sentencing and motions, and we have an off day. And we're to resume uh, with the 14 jurors uh, on Wednesday. At some point on that off day, I received a call from the party, the parties being the prosecution uh, and the defense. And the prosecution and the defense informed me that a plea agreement had been reached with the consent of the mother. And they detailed the plea agreement. Um, uh, required that I bind myself to what's called the wire rules of penal procedure rule 11. Um, um, and I did. Now, I'm somewhat upset because why didn't we have a plea agreement before we had 75 citizens come into my courtroom, before I set out one week of trial time for this case? Uh, before we I'm sorry, sorry, Judge, to interrupt. Can you speak a little louder? Some of us are having a hard time hearing you. 
Okay. Thank so, you. I'm sorry. Um, I, I So a plea agreement was reached with the consent of the uh, minor's mother, and this was assured to me on the record uh, by the prosecution and the defense. What was somewhat annoying time-wise about the plea agreement is we had picked a jury and double jeopardy attached. Um, no judge wants to go through the process of picking a jury and then in the midst of trial we have a plea agreement. It's just a monumental waste of money, time, and the citizens' uh, efforts in, in being jurors. But nevertheless, they had reached the plea agreement and showed me uh, why they wanted me to follow the plea agreement. Then comes sentencing. Again, on the record, the prosecution urged me to follow the plea agreement. The defense urged me to follow the plea agreement, and I followed the plea agreement. And that's what happened in this case. You know, and I'm 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 sorry that some that the mother of this child feels wounded. Um, but the reality of the situation was that this was a very highly emotional, complex case. Uh, the other aspect um, that I saw that's lacking in, 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 in reality is that I did not allow the defendant to, or I did not reject a prior plea agreement. Under Rule 32D in our constitutional provisions, the defendant was allowed to withdraw a plea. We teed the case up for trial, brought in all those jurors, and we're on our way to a trial until they reach the plea agreement. So that's that's what happened uh, in in that case. Thank you. Appreciate it. Senator Kim. Thank you. Go ahead. I think I, I think you're next. Go ahead. Thank you. I just want to follow up. Um, with you, uh, Judge Eddins, when we talked, and as we heard this today from the mother, uh, she said she did not give consent. So can you clarify that? I know you told me she gave consent. I asked her if she gave consent. She said she, there's nothing in writing. She didn't consent. So I'm a little bit confused here. Well, of course, I as the judge am not having any discussions with any witnesses, any parties. I rely on the representation of the prosecution and the defense when a plea agreement is used. And in relying on the prosecution's representations, both on the record and off the record, there was clear cut indication that the mother consented to a plea agreement in which the individual was placed on probation for many years. Subsequent to the sentencing hearing, I learned after the mother was in the news media making comments against the prosecuting attorney that the Department of the Prosecuting Attorney issued a press release saying that the mother consented to the plea agreement. Is it required to have something in writing from the mother if she consents? And was I there something know. in writing? You know, I'm not sure what the protocol of the Department of the Prosecuting Attorney is for that. But also, you should know this, is I think it's generally uh, a, an understanding uh, with the prosecuting attorney that they'll get feedback and understanding and, and, and oftentimes consent from uh, interested parties, but in the prosecution, their duties are to administer justice. There's no veto power by any uh, party over what they, in their belief, uh, is in the interest of justice. Um, and all I can go on is what's represented by both the prosecution and the defense and what they urge me to do in the interest of justice. And that's what I believe. I did in this particular case. I can certainly understand that, um, but in this case, when you actually heard from the mother who claims she didn't agree to the plea agreement, could you then have been able to withdraw that as a judge, hearing finally directly from the mother in this case when there was nothing on writing that she did not agree? Was there any way you could then say, you know, we're going to withdraw this? 
agreement? There's there's always dis some discretion. This was a binding Rule 11 plea agreement after double jeopardy had attached, which raised some very interesting legal arguments if I rejected the plea agreement. Uh, so How about just a withdrawal. If she decided to withdraw, is that, does she have a time limit as to when she can withdraw? The fact that she says she never agreed to it. Well, I'm not. I'm not so sure. You know, I just rely on what the prosecutions represent to me. Whatever discussions they may have had um, with a party, I'm not privy to at all. Understand. But you know, in a case like this, where you said the emotions are really high, a child. Um, you know, welfare is, is at stake, and certainly, you know, the family is of concern, I would imagine we would try to err on the side of caution and go slowly. And so I'm just concerned that if, in fact, she adamantly said she did not agree to the plea agreement, and there was still time for a withdrawal, uh, I'm not certain why that might not have been allowed, being that you did already have uh, done everything you did to get this case ready. Well, the case, as I mentioned, double, it, it was not a case where we did not have a jury that was already selected and that this agreement was reached in the midst of the case. So it was fraught with legal, legal obstacle in that sense. You know, and I'll say this, is plea agreements drive the criminal justice. If we didn't have plea agreements, uh, the backlog, uh, not at the appellate level, but at the trial level, would just be tremendous. And, and, you know, judges for the most part rely on the parties to, you know, work out a plea agreement. And that's uh, what happened in the midst of this case. And based on everything that transpired, um, the sentence which got a conviction and placed this individual on probation, um, you know, I, I simply followed that plea agreement. And I've, I've and let me just say this, is, you know, I've sentenced hundreds if not thousands of individuals many, many times on these types of, of hard, emotionally fraught cases. We make, judges make decisions uh, that are really emotionally charged um, on a daily basis. Okay, and I can understand we, that, and Judge. We just try to do our best. I, I appreciate that. I just thought, again, I'm just, con you know, concerned that in this case, you know, they're talking about an agreement, a plea agreement, which means that, you know, the victim should have agreed. Right? There should have supposed to be an agreement. So if, if they're saying they didn't agree, I'm just confused. I'm not an attorney, and I'm confused why it, why it was upheld when she said she didn't agree. Well, as, as I mentioned before, plea agreements are entered between the prosecuting entity and the defendant. Yeah, but in this case, the defense is saying she didn't agree. Well, not the defense, I'm sorry. Um, um, the victim saying she didn't agree. So, okay, I will, I will allow um, the next senator to question. I have other questions on another topic, um, Chair, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to Senator Kale Kaloli first and then followed by Senator St. Boyne Ventura. Go ahead, Senator Kale Kaloli. Uh, Yes, so I put my request in via the chat, but I'll defer to the congressman. I'm sorry, who's, <laughs> I'm happy to have people ask questions. Who's going though? Hey, uh, Chair, can I go? This Hi. Is yeah, okay, Senator Kelly, go ahead. Okay, great. Hey, thanks so much. And um, uh, mahalo, you know, Judge Edens for taking the time to uh, do the questionnaire that I sent over to you uh, and mahalo for sharing a little bit of your story and, and aloha to your son if he's in Bahrain I know it's about uh, 4 10 in the morning there I've, I've been to Bahrain myself and so uh, you know aloha to him and all of our service members uh, you know that are currently serving and deployed overseas um, my question for you was 
in regards uh, to our Supreme Court. You know, uh, in one of the questions I asked you, you, uh, you talked about um, that judges are sworn to follow the law. Judges do not enact laws. Um, I completely agree with you with that. Um, that's the legislature's role. But the Supreme Court obviously is the highest court in Hawaii. It does, in its decision, set precedent um, for years to come. Uh, and it's and it, you know, I think we have a great and outstanding uh, judiciary in the Supreme Court. It's one of the checks and balances in our democratic society. So um, I got three questions. The first one is, how would you see? your role on the uh, Supreme Court, if confirmed by the, uh, the Senate, uh, going forward um, and, and how it, its decisions uh, set precedent for, for many, many years to come. Thank you. Thank you for your comments on my, my son. Um, you know, I, I see my role as, as, as any justice. It's, it's a collaborative teamwork role. I mean, unlike individual judges right now. We all have our own domain and our own forums. And I see the collaborative teamwork efforts uh, of uh, appellate judges as, as really being an, a, a safeguard against arbitrariness. Because you have minds talking, you know, about, you know, various uh, legal issues and coming to a, a conclusion and a resolution that really works um, ideally for all. I see the role um, of justices as providing clarity to unclear law, to refining the law, to providing uniformity and predictability to guide uh, our community and their actions. And I, I just want to try to maintain doctrinal coherence uh, so that everything is clear and everybody knows um, the lay of the land, the law of the land, so to speak. In your resume uh, and your experience as a trial lawyer, it's clear you have extensive trial lawyer experience, you know, uh, and then of course your time as a judge. Um, you know, given that uh, at the federal level, you know, Attorney General Barr and many of President Trump's appointees at the federal level lack the basic and necessary trial experience, um, why do you think having extensive trial experience is important um and, and why um thank you for that question and yes it, it is somewhat surprising that um a notre dame professor who was not in the courtroom very much throughout her career is now on the highest court in the nation i think courtroom experience provides you with perspective which in my view is one of the most underrated judicial traits you have you need to be grounded in reality. You need to know and understand uh, really what transpires in the courts uh, of our nation and at least in our state. You have to be rooted in the fundamentals of the rules of evidence and rules of penal procedure and the case law. And unless you're really a litigator and understand sort of the boots on the ground aspect to our court system, I think it's difficult to then sit at a high level and make decisions that were made in the lower tribunal. So I think it's absolutely critical that you do have extensive trial experience to be a judge. Okay, and then and my final question is, is, is gonna be a, uh, probably my hardest one, but um, I understand you're a Washington Redskins uh, fan. And so, uh, as, ha as, as someone who, you know, is, is now going to have the honor to serve Hawaii and Washington, D.C., I'd like to know if it's worth it to go to a game in the near future while I happen to be in D.C. I think you're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, um, you know, they're going by the acronym uh, WFT, Washington football team now. Uh, I think you could maybe rearrange that based on the last 25 years to WTF. Um, you know, I'm a diehard Skins fan, and if you can go to a game, get out to FedEx and, and go. Um, used to, they used to fill the, the RFK and they used to fill FedEx. Now they don't, so you'll probably be able to easily get in and see them lose. Thank you. Thanks for answering my question, because I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Senator Kahele. I think Senator Kahele Kahele is next. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Judge Eddins. So, you know, uh, to, I guess to follow on 
your discussion about perspective and its necessity in serving on the bench uh, it seems to, so what, what I've been told is that the overwhelming majority of cases that go before the Supreme Court are criminal in nature uh, in which case you have a really significant uh, and comprehensive background on what would you say to those practitioners on the civil side who practice in employment law or real property or civil rights who may have issues come before your court and often the civil rights cases or the civil side cases are while, while not as uh, voluminous uh, on the, the Supreme Court docket are often the most significant uh, and polarizing uh, issues that come before the court. What would you say to those members of the bar and members of the community who have a really significant stake on on uh, on non-criminal matters about your ability to uh, play a role in the fair administration of justice should you be confirmed thank you senator you know i um i believe i have a a versatility that is unique a versatility unique that yes i'm Probably more well known, well known uh, for my for my criminal work, and, and then I've been sitting here as a criminal judge. But I have a broad-based experience, and it really resulted once um, or arose once I uh, left the public defenders, where I just really jumped into complex litigation and civil litigation and tried to to um, really immerse myself and soak up all the knowledge that I could to really, really. Um, make myself into an individual who understood not only employment law but family law and complex uh, litigation matters across the gamut and, and quite frankly it was intellectually challenging I have a curiosity I'm, I'm open-minded I'm flexible I want to learn my mindset is I want to learn you know five things every day and improve myself so um, for, for those individuals who, who sort of are more on the, on the civil side, I immerse myself. I read everything. I have sat as a substitute justice on many civil cases. And quite frankly, that law, because I, I, you know, I know the, the criminal law in the back of my hand, that law is really intellectually challenging and stimulating to me that, that I, I find myself immersing myself into it and, and really just enjoying you know, multifaceted, broad-based legal issues, legal disputes. It's just, it's just really challenging, and I and I love it. And and I I will do my best to just look at everything and 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 make my decisions to the best of my abilities. Okay, thank you. I have I have one more follow-up question to the dialogue that you had with Senator Kim and Favela regarding. Uh, the individual who testified in opposition at the beginning of the hearing. Uh, I, can we just, I, I'd like you to help me clarify the situation as it, as it relates to plea agreements, uh, especially after you've selected a jury. Uh, it, it seems like I, I'm not totally, uh, can you help me clarify, because I'm not totally sure here. The, the, like it or not, the way the law is written, you have the, the judge, on a criminal, uh, in a criminal matter, has discretion to review a plea agreement um, at, at any point in the in the trial, but is not required to take into account the wishes of the victim. Is it is that accurate? That, that is accurate, and and it's probably I was probably inartful in my responses to to, to Senator Kim uh, when I was answering the question. Is is and it sort of goes with the the veto power that I was talking about. It's the prosecution that really uh, has the role in our system in entering plea agreements. And quite frankly, they don't need to get the consent of any party or any litigant. It just so happens- You still as judge have the discretion to overrule an agreed to plea agreement brought, uh, brought about between the parties. There's, there's always discretion to do that. This was a binding plea agreement it would be an incredibly extraordinary circumstance in the midst of trial. What would happen then is this, is the individual would then be able to withdraw the plea uh, and we'd be back at square one with bringing in a new special panel uh, of, of jurors and the case would proceed 
to trial. But uh, you see, that's the part I don't quite understand. So you said a jury had been selected, and so a double jeopardy attaches. What 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 does that actually what does that actually mean? Well, I think what could have happened uh -huh. if if in this particular case the individual was then permitted to you know withdraw his plea. Um, well, one they would not want to withdraw the plea. They would, you know, make sure that I adhere to the plea agreement. Then I imagine there would probably be legal challenges because Jeopardy had attached. And I guess that's what I was trying to convey and maybe was not doing so in such a clear so, way. So what you're saying is that a plea agreement reached after a jury has been selected would be considered the resolution of the case. And so if after the fact... Uh, there was an attempt to prosecute thereafter, the defendant in that situation could come back and say, no, you guys already tried me, came to a resolution. Is that, is that, you're, are you saying that the, that the selection of the jury triggers uh, that potential outcome? And that's, that's, that's key is the potential outcome. I don't know how it would shake out legally. Um, it, it's, it's sort of, unusual terrain and it might have been something that would find its way up to the Supreme Court but yes those dynamics were at play in this particular situation versus any other plea agreement that somehow the judge uh, says hey look I'm not gonna follow the plea agreement. Okay so, so last question on this which is what uh, can you describe for us the, the, the conditions upon which uh, you as judge in that scenario would have executed your discretion and superseded an agreed to plea agreement. What what are the scenarios in which you would have you you would have potentially taken those extraordinary steps if you're saying that that's the that that's what would have been necessary to um, to act differently in that scenario? Yeah. Well, there's many considerations, and and I think it was Senator Favela that mentioned. You know, I have to hear the the other side of the story. What you're also not hearing is the other side of the story of, of the defendant in this particular case. A defendant who uh, denied um, the, the crimes. Uh, there was an amended plea agreement in the case, so uh, I would have to consider that. I wanted to go to trial and figure out really what had happened in the particular case. Um, but there was a plea agreement, and we didn't end up um, 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 doing that. So as far as an extraordinary circumstance, I, I'm hard pressed to really think of any cases on the third floor, which is the criminal circuit court, ju circuit court bench, where any judge has declined to follow a Rule 11 plea agreement uh, at a sentencing hearing. I just don't know. I, I haven't done it. And I'm just, and, and I'd be hard pressed to think that anyone has simply because plea agreements are relied upon for the expeditious resolution of cases and judges generally follow the plea agreement. Clearly there's discretion not to, but the practical reality is that courts stay out of it and let the parties work agreements and then tend to follow the plea agreements. And that's really the reality of the situation. In certain Thank you. Thank you. Thank hey, members, we've been going for a while now. Uh, let's take a five-minute break, a uh, six-minute break, come back at 2.30, give everybody a chance to stretch their legs. So we'll be back at 2.30. Okay. And can I be...
I just you know, I, not really, I, I don't know if it's really a question, but as as uh, um, the deciding judge, sorry, I go back to the case. I just I just something that came to my mind because you know Senator um, um, Jared. No, no, I try for the thing. No, uh, has another kind too. So no, so a couple. Um, not, not this hearing, but um, Senator Rose always asked. I think it was you, Senator Rose. I, I'm not sure, but we come to a plea agreement. I, I, re, I remember one of the senators in, in, in a committee always asked, "We come to a plea agreement with something so sensitive and so emotional that it is." And I know you just got you saying that the, pr the prosecutor really don't have to have an agreement from the victim, um, if, if I'm correct. Um, but with something as sensitive of that nature, and uh, I guess the, the, I, I'm not sure because I didn't see the case. I'm not an attorney or a judge, but apparently had a, had enough evidence for the um, uh, what's called that. What do you do when you present them before you before you go to trial and the guy get arrested? What is it called? Um, when you present it to a bunch of uh, arraignment? No, you know when you present it to. Come on, Jerry. Help me out, Senator Jerry. When you present the case, and then the oh, grand jury. Sorry, sorry, guys. Too much TV. Anyway, um, when when the, this evidence and uh, overwhelming evidence was presented to the grand jury, and the grand jury had enough to have this person arrested and then go to trial, um, knowing the sensitivity of the case and knowing that um, the appeal process or the um, plea agreement came before you. Um, you have the authority to deny or um, not accept the plea agreement um, according to the evidence is before you, right? Correct. Okay. So, um, I mean, I, I, I just, just not understanding. So, so did this, did this, because um, it took a while before the trial had, had uh, start, right? Had a lot of delays, right? There were many delays before the case was assigned to me. I have generally been one of the judges who've been tasked with, uh, let's say, being a judge in complex, uh, difficult cases. So prior to the case reaching me, it had been continued many times. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see. Uh, member Sin, any other questions? Oh, uh, before before Senator San Buenaventura. Okay, go ahead, Senator uh, San Buenaventura. Go ahead. Sorry, and, and I know I'm not a committee member, so I really appreciate this, Chair Rhodes. Um, so I, I'm just using my experience as a trial attorney. Um, you said anyway in Hilo. When Rule 11 first came out that binds the judges, not all judges agreed to be bound by a Rule 11 binder. Um, on Oahu, is it custom to allow to bind the court to rule, um, to plea agreements? The plea agreement itself, uh, and in this case, and generally speaking, most plea agreements from the Department of the Prosecuting Attorney, City and County of Honolulu, require in the plea agreement itself that the court bind itself. In other words, we're not going to give a plea agreement unless the court binds itself. Uh, okay. it, so both the prosecution and the defense have an interest in, in the court binding itself. And uh, that is, in my view, somewhat standard protocol over here. So. Um, I know when the courts do, well, again, here in Hilo, I, I don't practice on Oahu, when they do plea agreements, basically they also look at their experiences with the prosecutor and the defense attorneys and to see whether or not they can rely upon their agreements. Did you have any history with the prosecutor to rely upon what she or he said that the victim agreed? I, I have. Uh, this particular prosecuting attorney, despite some of the comments I've heard, was a seasoned prosecuting attorney. Uh, she is 
a, a person who I have respect for because she's been in my courtroom many times on these very sensitive cases and has handled herself with professionalism, uh, candor, and upfrontness. So uh, this was a prosecutor that has done fine work in my courtroom, and I had no reason to distrust her representations. Okay, so um, when, and I believe when I, when I asked um, Ms. Vartijeran about whether or not she agreed, I think she reluctantly said she did, but she felt that she was browbeaten by the prosecutor into agreeing to this plea agreement. Um, did you get any kind of impression that that, that occurred? when you agreed, when you did the Rule 11 binder and agreed to the plea agreement? No. And I guess one other thing, and I know, I, like, again, this is my experience. In the event that you, that there was no plea agreement, because you just said there were 75 people, there was um, an impanelment of the jury, and frankly, in, in my doing some defense cases, that's usually when I get the best plea agreement. It's like right there at the impanelment of the jury because the prosecutor has to know whether or not, with, you know, whether or not he or she is prepared and whether or not he or she has the witnesses to win. Was there, in the event you decide there was no plea agreement or as Senator Kim said, you decide that in a case like as sensitive as this, that you would like to continue it to see whether or not the victim has agreed. Was there a second set? Was there another trial that could have gone? Because no, this was a case that, as I mentioned, um, I was assigned to uh, as it had been pending for a while. And we set aside the whole week exclusively for this case. The, the plea agreement that was reached between the parties was a surprise. I mean, and it kind of upset me because we had just consumed, you know, a, a, a jury, thousands of dollars, but more importantly, people's times. I mean, people who have other things to do than, than to do jury duty. And we um, picked the jury. This is, you know, we've done about 90 jury trials and, and over the course of my stint here. And only two, this is one of two, were plea agreements reached in the midst of the trial. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Rowan. Thank you, members. Let me ask a couple questions following up on this, and then we'll do another round. Um, so you, you mentioned, Judge, that uh, once double jeopardy is attached, that there, be, there become some knotty legal issues. Um, as the defense attorney, what what is that what what is that uh, what do those challenges look like what what you know what rule would you be make filing them uh, sorry what rule would you move under or what exactly would be the thing that you would see as the weakness if the the prosecutor backed out of a uh, a plea agreement in this situation where double jeopardy had attached already well it, w it would be really the court backing out of the plea agreement um i would imagine that the uh, defense would, would say, hey, there's a binding plea agreement that the prosecution entered into that you agreed to follow. We have already picked a jury. We were ready to roll. And jury, since it's been picked, there's double jeopardy attached, um, would suggest that, no, you have to follow the plea agreement. You can't not follow the plea agreement. And if you don't follow the plea agreement, we're going to um, appeal it under state and the whole federal uh, you know the double jeopardy clauses what's the actual procedure procedural thing that you would do is it a motion or is it uh, I, what, what would it, what would it look like I would imagine again I'm, I'm, I guess I'm putting back on my back on your public defense my, my defense attorney cap um, but yeah I mean I, I have no doubt the defense would then file file a motion um, I don't know how they fashion it what it would be called but yeah clearly the very motion uh, requiring uh, the, the plea agreement that everybody agreed to and that, that, and that they required me to bind myself to uh, should be effectuated. Okay. Um, so I realize this was a convoluted case and, you're, and you were the judge. You were not the judge for the whole case. 
However, you were the last judge that handled it. And on August 2, 2018, you allowed the defendant to withdraw from an earlier plea agreement, the defendant to withdraw from an earlier plea agreement on May 10, 2018. And at that earlier hearing, the minutes note that, in quoting here, court advised defendant that he will not be able to withdraw his plea. Defendant acknowledged the understanding. But then on August 2, 2018, the minutes note that the court, which is you, uh, noted that there was clear anim animosity between the defendant and his lawyer and defendant, I mean, sorry, between his lawyer and, his def and the defendant. And it's not clear that there was a full understanding of the change in the consequences of, of his plea. I mean, at the earlier plea, at the, the first plea agreement, is there really any doubt that the defendant knew what he was agreeing to? That wasn't the legal issue. Um, pursuant to Rule 32D, that's how I rose of penal procedure, Rule 32D, there's a liberal approach to allowing a defendant who asserted his innocence prior to sentencing to withdraw his plea. Uh, and in this particular case, if I recall, and, and I have to look back exactly, uh, the plea was allowed to be withdrawn due to some constitutional effective representation of counsel concerns. Uh, so that but, was, but the earlier counsel was one of the, you know, he's a prominent defense attorney in town. I mean, is, was it really a question of whether he was being adequately served? I mean, the defendant was being adequately served? It was. Okay. Um, so Mr. Brogman was indicted in May of 2015, which I realize is long before you had the case. It looks like there were, by our count, there were 10 defense continuances between then and when you took over the case in December 2018, 10. And in January 2019, you granted another defense continuance, and I believe there was another stipulated one, which that's fine, I get that. But when the prosecutor asked for a continuance in February 2019 because they couldn't get a witness to the trial, he denied the motion. And I realize it's the prosecutor's burden to prove the charges, and I realize that you ruled that the witness that they wanted to bring was not a material witness. But you know, defense gets a, gets a, eleven continuances, and you, you can't grant one for the for the for the prosecutor. I have to, you know, it, I have to look back exactly on the scenario. But this case then was set firm. There's also legal evidentiary issues as to the propriety of a last minute continuance on that particular issue. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not clear exactly what the evidentiary prong to it was or the procedural prong to it was, but there are cases, and I think State versus Laura might be the most recent case, talking about how that type of testimony for that type of witness um, uh, would improperly bolster the uh, testimony. So I'm not sure exactly what the evidentiary thing ruling was precisely on that issue. But as far I, I, I realize the minutes are sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're minutes, so they're not, they're not, they don't pick up a lot of nuance sometimes, but it, it says that you ru ruled that she was not a material witness and okay, therefore we're going forward. I, I, I suppose that, and again, I can't recall exactly, but um, if there was not, a, if that was what the minutes reflect, then probably I listened to both the prosecution and defense as to the import and whether this witness would even be testifying evidentially because we don't want to do a trial but then there's error and then the trial has to be done once again but the bottom line if i recall correctly is the case was set firm i was tasked with you know moving this case and and, and everybody who knows who comes into my courtroom well, when cases are firm you don't come in with a last minute uh continuance it's time to go now there are you know exceptions to that but this particular rationale probably and again i'm trying to re recollect was not a proper justification for the continuance because i'm not sure that witness would have even been allowed to testify based on some of the arguments that the defense was offering or would proffer. okay okay thank you members uh, any other questions 
Senator Kim, did you say you had uh, additional questions? Um, Senator um, Lee has a question. Oh, uh, Senator Lee, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. By thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Judge Eddins. Uh, you know, from time to time, the legislature passes constitutional amendments. Um, recently, one of those was um, set aside by the judiciary prior to a vote by the public. Uh, and there's a question as to what is uh, vague and what is appropriate. Um, obviously, we're going to still continue to push forward constitutional amendments in the future. Do you have a view about what, where that line is drawn between what is um, specific and vague? And then secondly, um, would it be appropriate for the judiciary, um, or excuse me, for the legislature to request from the Supreme Court uh, perhaps an early advisory ruling or some sort of opinion on these things before they are finally passed and invalidated after the legislature has an opportunity to correct any deficiency that might be present? Thank you, Senator. I, I believe what you're probably referring to is a case called City and County the final order versus state which dealt with the constitutional amendment on a, uh, a surcharge tax um for i think educational purposes now, I'm, I'm not going to exactly talk precisely about that case because I, I, I think i'm restrained but as far as your question as far as interpretation what's ambiguous or not um you know there's tools that any judge uses to uh, ascertain what we want to do, which is to ascertain the effect uh, of the law as gleaned from the legislature. In other words, what do the legislature mean? You folks, what did you really mean uh, by this law? And you look at the plain meaning of the words and try to effectuate legislative intent through that. If there is something ambiguous, there's other tools that we use. And that's looking at, for example, legislative history, the spirit of the law. There's actually a statute 1-15 it talks about the tools to use to determine whether something is ambiguous uh, or not. So that's what um, a, a judge would use to try to figure out um, the meaning and try to effectuate the intent of, of the legislature. As far as your second question about uh, the wisdom of seeking uh, perhaps an advisory opinion from the court before there's a constitutional amendment, I'd, I'd actually have to look at you know the exact um, um, laws to that effect. We we deal with cases and controversies, but I would think that um, there is a mechanism, especially on something as large as a constitutional amendment, which you don't want to um, uh, place on the ballot, uh, and then have the court you know o you know o o overturn uh, that. Uh, that amendment before it reaches the public i would think we'd we'd have a mechanism and the court would be more than willing to uh render um an opinion on that sense in other words, we're, whether we're on track or not thank you thank you chair thank you thank, thank you senator lee next is uh, senator kim i believe yes thank you again um Judge Edens, uh, we talked about this in um, when we met, and you mentioned earlier that uh, the court and the judges should follow the laws and not make the laws. And so, just wanted to get your sense about, um, you know, certain rulings that have come down on the courts that, that seem to set policy from the bench. Can you just comment on that? Um, generally, uh, you know, I think this. You know, I, I look at. I think you're talking about separation of powers, and really, that's that's a cornerstone of our democracy. Um, you know, the institutional partition uh, is a design in our constitution that has served our country well. It's made our country stronger. It's made our constitution stronger. And really, I think the tensions between the executive, legislative, judicial branch, and and whatever combination you want to use is something that's been around our country for 250 years. Uh, recently, in our community at least, uh, there has been um, um, uh, questions about whether the legislature is staying in its lane, whether the judiciary is staying in its lane, whether the executive is staying in its lane. And those are all valid, valid discussions and dialogues that need to uh, occur. Because as I said, there's, there's always been tension. There probably, you know, always will be. My general um, um, philosophy in this uh, area is prudential restraint, meaning 
that um, we should, um, the judiciary that is, should should not be going head to head with the legislature or the executive branch on certain matters. That we should be deciding cases based on the facts uh, and the law, not any policy preferences. That's your Juliana. Uh, I view uh, my decision making as looking squarely at the law, applying the facts to the law, and with fidelity and allegiance to the law, coming out with a, a, a square decision. Uh, I, I don't think anybody's personal policy preferences should play any role whatsoever in the judicial decision-making process. And I think that all branches of our government you know, should respect the dignity of, of each branch. I mean, every branch, we, we, you know, look, we're all in it together. I think we all need to operate in sync um, and with the dignity and respect of each of the branches. And that's sort of the approach that I would, I would try to bring. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And finally, I just wanted to ask you, what do you think the Supreme Court's role should have, should be and uh, in the case of early release of prisoners that we had uh, earlier uh, with, the, with the COVID-19 situation and the fact that the Supreme Court decided to get involved and, um, and allow some of these releases? Uh, what, what's your take on that? Um, let me preface an answer. Um, you know, again, the Judicial Code 2.10 suggests that I, I shouldn't be making comments about pending or impending matters, and that's a matter that could come up if, if I am if I am confirmed. But I don't want to deflect, and and I think you know that, and and many of the people I talked with, I, I tried to speak with candor about various issues with you. Um, uh, those emergency orders, I, I, you know, were something that the Supreme Court considered, and and and, and in their uh, judgment and in their best interests and their best intentions, decided that that was an approach um, that uh, should occur uh, due to due to the pandemic. Um, so that's an approach that that you know maybe is going to reoccur since unfortunately the pandemic is you know possibly getting worse. I think there's tools in place right now uh, to effectuate those emergency orders without the emergency orders. In other words, you know, you folks pass bail reform. Uh, there's other measures uh, that courts can take. Uh, I think there's good intentions to the emergency release orders, um, um, but I also think that there uh, are other existing measures and approaches uh, that can be taken uh, as well. Okay. Um, so you don't think that there was an overreach in, in this um, case? And I know it may come up again. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, just trying to hopefully get the, our uh, judicial, you know, to stay in their lane as we stay in our lane and so forth. So, because um, I know the public was very much concerned about the way it was, um, brought out the way it was implemented um so you know in fact i've heard from um from public defenders saying that they didn't even know that the rulings are going to come out who was going to be released they didn't have an opportunity to um to even call those prisoners that were being released because you know they found out last minute so to me that didn't sound like something that was really thought out as to um, how that was going to be handled. I, I you know, and I, I've heard those concerns, and I, I understand those concerns. And let me just leave leave, leave you with this again. I, I really think we have bright minds right right now up on the Supreme Court. And again, I think people act with the best intentions. You know, when you look from the outside, whether you're a legislature, or whether you're a member of the public, or just a concerned person who's who's been in one of our courts. Um, you know, judges agonize over decisions. Judges are, are not cavalier in the decisions we make, and we, we really try to do our best and, and just try to make sensible, rational decisions. And you know what? We're going to get criticized, and, and that's, that's part of what goes with the job. You know, we're tasked with making the tough calls, and, and we do, and I, and I perfectly understand uh, any legitimate criticism uh, from from any member of the public, any legislator, any you know person on the side of the street. I mean that just comes with the territory. 
Um, but we have to act uh, uh, under the law and the facts and what we really deem uh, is the appropriate resolution. The fact that you've um, worked uh, in the legislative process and uh, hopefully you will give that um, perspective as you go forth with the courts as to the legislative uh, branch and um, the separation of powers as you could see it on both sides and I think that's important and you know during the confirmation period is our only time to actually get a sense from those that are going to be sitting for a long time on, on and um, making decisions on a lot of these issues that affect the general public who elect us obviously and look to us to make sure that we put people on the uh, in the courts that's going to also look out for the for the best interests of the general public so i appreciate your responses thank you thank you and, and you know i want to if i can make just w w one more somewhat comment on that you know we had a we had a very very we meaning the judiciary and the legislative branch had a very fruitful dialogue last year at Kapiolani community college and in in the spirit and the effort in, in, in us all being in it together and trying to work out uh, the respect and the dignity we should have for each branches, we had a very, very, I thought, instrumental, vital, very fruitful dialogue. And, and I'm hoping that we can continue to do that because I think when there's dialogue, um, people understand the other side. Um, and, and I tell you what, I've read the Federalist Papers, number 51, the, the whole uh, un, undercurrent of our separation of powers and the design and structure of our government. And I appreciate the independence of each of our three branches. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Or who would like to go next? I'm not hearing or seeing anyone at the moment, so I'll go next. And if you guys come up with anything else, let me know. Um, so uh, this is uh, looking at the appellate, looking at the, the job that you're applying for, what would your approach be to cases where the defendant appears to have a mental health issue or a substance abuse condition that impacts their decision-making ability? Well, I'll approach it two ways. I'll approach it the way I handle things right now. Um, I think most judges now are sensitive, really sensitive to those who uh, have mental health issues and how those mental health issues relate to the criminal justice system and there's sort of been just a, a nice wonderful shift in that perspective over let's say the last 10 years or so and i credit the legislature for for recognizing that and passing laws that that really understand that at the appellate level uh you know we're you know the judiciary is is really simply looking at discrete issues, legal issues, and factual and lawful issues. So it would really sort of depend on the record before us and what the points of error and what the real legal dispute is on a case involving somebody uh, with mental health uh, issues. I do know that there is, um, you know, recent case law uh, dealing with uh, the, I guess, extra efforts that need to be undertaken uh, when a court uh, engages somebody with mental health issues. So in terms of, I mean, we have several, uh, well, some that have been on the books for a long time, like involuntary commitment if the person is a danger to other themselves or others. Um, and then a little farther down the continuum, we have the Assisted Community Treatment Act, which is newer and hasn't been used a lot. And then there are guardianships, diversion programs like uh, Act 26 from last year, uh, I mean, last session this, this year. Um, in terms of the judiciary, to the, judiciary, the judiciary's power to restrain or order the mentally ill or those who are using substance abuse or, or suffer from substance abuse, do you have any? Do you see any legal? Do you see any legal impediments? I mean, on, on the let me back up a little on the on the involuntary commitment side. Of course, that's been around forever, and that happens fairly routinely. But the sort of intermediate um, responses to uh, mental health problems and substance abuse problems. Do you see any uh, constitutional impediments to implementing the the lower level the the, the laws that are lower on the continuum? 
in other words, to take away, there's still a liberty interest, but it's not as great as actually restraining you in a, you know, in the state hospital. Um, uh, if, if I understand your question correctly, I, I think you're, you're discussing civil involuntary commitment matters. And generally speaking, um, you know, if somebody's a danger to themselves or others, they can be involuntarily committed. I, I think the involuntary commitment side of it's pretty settled, but I was thinking more in terms of the, the ones where the judge, where the Assisted Community Treatment Act, for example, can a judge can order you to take your meds. So I'm thinking more of the, one, the ones that are lesser impingements on liberty. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, there, there are constitutional issues associated with um, forcing somebody to take their medication. It doesn't mean that the court can't do that. There, there's many um, criteria that, that has to be shown um, and burdens met uh, to, to force somebody to take medication. And that law is actually pretty straightforward and well-developed. Um, so the, the, the mechanisms are there um, for um, whether it be involuntary commitment or, um, or you know, forced medication is, is, is a very interesting legal issue because it does impact, as you say, liberty issues. So, you know, there, there's, there's laws on the books uh, already on, on, on those circumstances and those issues. So, but you, do you agree that uh, actually putting someone in a state hospital is a, a, a bigger impingement on a liberty than simply ordering them to take their drugs? Because in the hospital, of course, they can order you to take your drugs in addition to keeping you in, the, in, the, in a, a cell, basically. No, no doubt, no doubt. I mean, really, when you're at the state hospital, for example, I mean, that's, it's close to confinement. Uh, so there, there, there are, are obviously much greater liberty interests there. Okay, uh, I have more questions, members. But if somebody else wants to have a go, yeah, right. I have a question. Okay, Senator Kale, Kale Okololi, go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, can you comment on access to justice? The the courts have, I think, made progress to expand access to justice uh, more recently. I'm wondering because you see, uh, because because uh, you have extensive experience um, in the criminal process. What are what are some of the barriers that you think are are remaining? Because I, I, I and I'll say this: I, the, the reason I bring this up is I hear what you're saying about the the primary duty of the judiciary being to impartially weigh the facts against the law. But there are these systemic undercurrents uh, that play out in the management of the judiciary. And as an associate justice of the Supreme Court, there are, you are going to have a role in that. And there, I, I think you've, you've mentioned it here, and definitely the judiciary has acknowledged that there are systemic impediments to the a more fair administration of justice. I'm wondering from your view, what are some of those areas that we can continue to expound on to, together between the legislature and the judiciary? Because that is one of the areas that I think we have made good progress. I agree with you. There's been tremendous progress on, on uh, the access to justice for, for both self-represented litigants, or litigants who, whose um, native language is not English, and English is their second language, people who uh, are disadvantaged monetarily, um, individuals who, who are homeless. So there's been um, an incredible awareness about that, led by you know, many prominent individuals in our, in our uh, legal community. So um, that is being nicely taken care of. If you're also talking about um, matters of standing or judiciability issues and things of that nature, there, the recent um, case law uh, is tending to establish a more expansive um, standing types of requirements and, and allowing individuals um, to uh, be heard, whether it's during agency proceedings or, or in court. 
Uh, and I think that's healthy. I, I, I think, you know, wh why not um, listen to uh, competing views on things? So um, I think there's an awareness of that, um, if that answers your question. So I think, you know, not necessarily, so I'm not asking a question necessarily as it relates to the development of case law. Uh, I'm talking about the judiciary's efforts to address systemic problems with individuals often socioeconomically disadvantaged or uh, who have mental health or substance abuse or whole, uh, issues with homelessness to, to access and participate in the fair administration of, of justice on their part. And I think it ties into what the chair is talking about. Assisted community treatment, in my view, is meant to address the issue of individuals who have been chronically or persistently, uh, uh, who have been chronically homeless or who have suffered from persistent mental health conditions, who are not necessarily a danger to themselves or others, but are clearly in an impaired state and are, are quite obviously from the nature of the situation they're in, uh, unable to, um, uh, unable to get themselves out of it or unable to work with or access help that that has been uh, that is accessible to other members of the community and those are individuals that often end up before your court in the criminal calendar uh, because of interactions or or uh, behaviors or or situations that really could have been prevented otherwise and so there, I think, I think what we're talking about here is the intersection between the branches where there are obvious systemic problems that haven't necessarily been uh, implemented by the judiciary or the uh, executive branch or the legislature necessarily to address those societal challenges. And they're impacting it, all of the branches and the public in general. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think... Um, at least from the judiciary's perspective, there's been an advancement in specialty courts. I mean, we're, we're striving, you know, for example, the homeless board and the various specialty courts. Um, I, to a certain extent, you know, diversion programs are helpful. I think this, again, some of the issues you're talking about, Senator, um, are conversations that um, the branches should have and, and enabled with the goal of facilitating uh, justice and access to justice and all the issues you're talking about. Um, you know, we're always, the judiciary that is, is always all open ears for anything that's practical, reasonable, sensible, and works under the law. Chair. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, members, any other questions? I mean, sorry, next round, there's still more questions, but. Okay, I'll ask a couple more, and then if anybody else has something, just go ahead and uh, uh, jump in. So, with the, uh, with the confirmation of uh, Justice Coney Barrett at the U.S. Supreme Court level, um, people have been talking again more about abortion rights and whether Roe v. Wade will survive in its current form. Uh, what I wanted to ask you about, though, was, I mean, Hawaii obviously has a, a long tradition of, of providing for abortion. And um, I think, if I remember correctly, we were the first state that legalized it. And we have our constitution in this regard is somewhat different than the U.S. Constitution. We do have an explicit privacy right. Are you aware of any case law from the Hawaii Supreme Court that's interpreted that privacy right to include abortion? Not specifically, and, and, and the abortion was, as you mentioned, we were the first state to legalize it in 1970, and it's, it's enshrined in Section 453-16, so abortion is legal here. You're referring to Article 1, Section 6, which is our right to privacy, and no, I mean, there's a, there's a case called Mueller, I think it was from 1983, and it was Justice Nakamura who wrote it, who kind of touches upon it, and what he says in that decision, he quotes the legislative history from the 78 CONCON, and the 78 CONCON Committee of the Whole 
essentially stated that our right to privacy encompasses personal autonomy similar to Roe versus Wade and Griswold, which is the contraceptive case from the United States Supreme Court. So while not explicitly, I think um, uh, it's there uh, that uh, we have absolutely rejected the notion that abortion should be uh, illegal uh, in the state of Hawaii. So if, if it, if, if it, okay, I, I think that's probably as far as I should push you on that one. Um, let me switch to another topic that has national implications, and that's Obamacare. I think the U.S. Supreme Court heard an, an Obamacare case just recently, like within the last week. And, of course, this is not the first time it's been up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, some of us in Hawaii, we worry about the interaction of Obamacare and prepaid, prepaid uh, health care act. Um, if Obamacare were to be repealed, do you see any legal danger for the Prepaid Health Care Act? Let me preface it this way. Um, no, but I haven't, I can't say that I've really delved into the, the legal uh, issues surrounding it. Um, I, I think our Prepaid uh, Health Care Act stands alone. Uh, and that there should, there's likely uh, no impact uh, should the United States Supreme Court engage in further conservative judicial activism. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, I'll keep going then. Um, let's see, what else I want to ask you about? So you wrote an, an article in the the now defunct Honolulu Weekly back in 1997. And the quote that jumped out at me was, unfortunately, the prospect of longer sentences does not deter crime for persons already engaged in impulsive and risky behavior. And that's the end of the quote there. Um, is deterrence of crime the only reason to have longer sentences? Oh, certainly not. Um, in fact, there's a large body of research that says, you know, high and significant criminal penalties have no deterrent effect. Um, uh, you know, the legislature has given us judges real tools to evaluate any sentencing. It's in Hawaii by statute section 706606, where a wide variety of factors are used. And what the legislature uh, has stated that, um, you know, rehabilitation uh, deterrence, promotion of respect for the law, and underscoring the seriousness of, of the conduct are all factors. So deterrence is, is just one, and it might not be the most significant factor to people who are engaging in risky behavior, because quite frankly, they don't necessarily think of the repercussions of, of their actions. Um, so there's a whole slew of sentencing factors. Um, thank you for bringing up that 1997 Honolulu Weekly um, uh, missive. I mean, I guess 97 was the year I was just, you know, Scarlet Letter, you know, Honolulu Weekly. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I think the the rationale behind that um, article to the to the Honolulu Weekly is because at the time, um, and it came out of the presidential election, there was the whole harsh crime bills from the mid uh, 90s. And I think the legislature at that time uh, was really seriously contemplating a truth in sentencing law, which would have required 85% of an individual sentence be served. And that was sort of what I was um, railing about with colorful language. Um, let me switch gears. So originalism, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the term. How would you define it? Um, as a silly way to interpret a law. Look, originalism has been adopted by the Federalist Society crew um, who tend to be feeders for the United States Supreme Court. And really what originalism looks at is simply words. They do not look at any extrinsic aids. Extrinsic aids meaning, you know, what is the legislature's intent? What is the legislative history? Hawaii has a rich tradition of looking uh, at a law, looking at the plain meaning, and if there's any type of ambiguity, 
looking at other aids to effectuate the legislative intent. And that means um, looking uh, at what you folks really meant. It is alarming in the sense that the originalists who are dominating the, Hawaii, the United States Supreme Court now, um, if we talk about separation of powers, uh, look, at it, look, look at it this way. And they're using originalism to jettison decades of campaign finance laws. And that's a Citizens United case from 2010. They jettisoned based on originalism ideas um, the 1965 uh, Voters uh, Right Act, uh, and that's in the Shelby uh, County versus Holder case. Uh, if you talk about um, a body, a judicial body that is really not respecting uh, the separation of powers, uh, in my view, it is the United States Supreme Court um, uh, that has been quite activist. Well, my next question was to ask you whether you were, you were an originalist yourself, but it's pretty clear from that answer that you're not. Let me let me ask you a related question about textualism. How would you differentiate textualism from uh, originalism, or is it same side of the same the different sides of the same coin, or how do you look at that? It's it's virtually the the, the same same side of the the coin. Originalism and textualism. Um, you're really not looking at uh, anything outside the actual uh, uh, words. Um, originalism actually uh, might be a harsher um, strain of, of, of textualism because you're actually looking, you know, who, what do the people in the Whigs in the 1700s do? Um, so, you know, I, I side more uh, with Justice Breyer, for example, in his book and, and some of the other great justices who, who really believe that we shouldn't necessarily look at how things were in the 1700s. We've evolved as a society. Uh, aspects of our society have changed and we need to change with the times. Okay, thank you. I have one more question and I'll turn it back over to the rest of the committee to see if they have anything else. Um, have you ever been criticized for imposing too harsh a sentence? I don't know if I've been criticized as posing too harsh a sentence or too light of a sentence, though today there was certainly a lot of criticism of the too light of a sentence. But, you know, I, I imagine I have. Um, probably when lawyers... Let me it a different way. Have you ever given somebody the maximum sentence that was available to you and when you made the sentencing decision? Oh, no doubt. You know, I quite frankly, uh, I think probably a lot of the public defenders and frankness is always appreciated. <laughs> yeah, maybe I shouldn't preface it with that. But I, I think, you know, interestingly enough, you know, a, a weird I not mean, how weird is the right term, but an interesting dynamic of judges is this is when prosecutors get on the bench, um, the prosecutors and, and even defense think, well they're wow, suddenly they're going lenient on the person. Defense guys get on the bench, you know, women and men, we were former private lawyers, public defenders. Oftentimes there's a criticism is we're too harsh on, on individuals. Uh, so I, I, I've probably been criticized outside the confines of my courtroom uh, both ways. Uh, I have in many, many times uh, imposed the harshest possible sentence. But again, I, it has to, you know, you have to look at individualized justice. I mean, every case is different. Uh, you can have a, a so-called harsh sentence, a so-called lenient sentence, and people would parse and disagree with whether it is harsh, whether it is lenient, whether it is just. Justice in the system, and we deal with hundreds and thousands of cases, it has to be individualized. Um, I have you know, just to dispel any notion that somehow I'm pro-child rapist, I think we're hard pressed to find anybody in this, in, in the whole state that's pro-child rapist. But what's, what has to be happening with any judicial decision making is the fairness and, 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 and looking at the law and, and, and the facts in any decision. So I've been, I've been overly harsh, I think, and I've reconsidered decisions uh, sometimes perhaps people have thought I've been too lenient um, and you know any criticism that's, that's lodged my way hey you know I'll take it it's part of the job okay members uh, any other questions 
Yeah, uh, I have a, I have another question. Yeah, Go ahead. Thank you. What's your view of state and county agency discretion, uh, and how would you characterize the boundaries of agency decision making? I think um, there is a fair amount of discretion that should be given to to agencies in their decision making process. The reason being is that they are the experts. Um, they are um, the body that um, uh, has expertise in certain matters. And when you're talking about DLNR or PUC or any of these various agencies, uh, it's clear cut under our case law that they're to be given uh, um, deference in, in their decision making. Now they have to operate uh, under the law and under the constitution and within that framework. But I think uh, any judge um, uh, is 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 duty bound to to give them uh, an agency that is uh, 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 the deference that they deserve. Okay, and uh, well, in, as it relates to the so the next question is as it relates to the state constitution. You mentioned um, uh, you you had some remarks related to interpretation of constitutional provisions based off of a question uh, that Senator Lee asked earlier and senator rules also brought up the unique nature of the state constitution compared to the the federal uh, constitution are there are there any specific provisions um are there any particular provisions particularly the the, the constitutional uh the, the 1978 amendments which in your view require further explanation? Well, I'll tell you what, um, you know, our, our Hawaii constitution really has some sparkling tendrils in it. I mean, our we, we go back to a 1967 case, State versus Texera, which basically said that, you know, our constitution, when there's similar provisions of the federal constitution, uh, are grander. There's greater protections to us. We have several really unique provisions in our constitution. Article 11, section one, Article 12, uh, Section 4. Those are the public trust, tro public trust doctrine um, constitutional provisions uh, that we have. And um, there is a rich body of law that has been developed uh, on this in, in both of those areas. And, you know, as far as when, when you ask from, you know, my ex explanation as to um, um, these provisions, uh, like statutory interpretation, um, really due regard to the framers intent needs to be taken into consideration. And the framers on a constitutional amendment are really the people, uh, as well as the legislative body. And that's why legislative history is so important. For example, the CONCON uh, records and reports there. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if that answered your, your question, Senator, but that's, those are my thought processes. Well, I guess, you know, as it relates to Native Hawaiian rights, for example, you know, you can interpret some of those amendments uh, as they relate back to, you know, pre-statehood case law or um, actually just general pre-statehood law. And uh, I think there is a balance, you know, to come back around to your interpretation, your constitutional interpretation discussion. Uh, that I think is important to note, you know, when it comes to the public trust or when it comes to the traditional customary practices, some of those constitutional provisions relate back to practices that took place, you know, prior to statehood, prior to the, the state's entrance into the union as a territory. And so, in some of those situations, you may be asked to go back and interpret case law or practices that took place uh, a lot, you know, it, like you mentioned, in the 1800s or perhaps earlier. And so I guess that's sort of where, where I was getting at in terms of your interpretation of the Constitution. There are going to be instances potentially and potentially as they relate to really really significant and, and or, or otherwise divisive issues that could come before the court that relate back to really old case law and uh, uh, and societal practices in Hawaii. 
Yeah, you know, when, when you do look at constitutional interpretation or statutory interpretation for, for, for that matter, you know, we do have a rich history of, of looking back into the past. In fact, if you read many of, of the, the decisions, including the recent decisions, or even the decisions from um, C.J. Richardson when he was affirming uh, public ownership uh, of the natural resources, uh, they trace um um the rights we're talking about and the practices customary practices back to king commandment the first king commandment the third and and back to those days and that's just i guess all the the common law this constellation of ideas that we we have that have just built been built up uh all are matters that really go into the calculus of the judicial decision making and you know, and and back when C.J. Richardson was was making um, his um, landmark decisions uh, on the public trust, um, um, that's what he was doing, and that's what you know. Fairly recently, the court's been doing as well. So there, there are some in the uh, there are some in in academia and even in the legal community who believe that uh, the recognition of some of those those rights uh, that existed in the pre-statehood common law existed in, and, and it should be considered, uh, and, and some of, the, some of the, uh, the concepts that existed in the oral tradition uh, should be considered common law. Um, for example, the, the notions of beach access and, and the rights to ancillary resources outside of the individual kuleana within an ahupua'a. And so, and so that's what I'm getting at, you know, as those notions of how the law was historically applied change or, or developed in academia and, and potentially come in conflict with our current systems of regulatory or, or uh, uh, agency discretion, I'm wondering how, you know, it seems like the fact that you're uh, not enthused with the originalist approach that there could be an avenue for more de a development of case law in, in some of those areas as, as we get more controversies uh, relating to traditional customary practices or Native Hawaiian rights uh, in the community. You know, it, these are really weighty issues that really impact um, our way of life. And I think the court has always strived to have a good sensible balance when it's wrestling with these these difficult issues and 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 in part of having the balance i think is just looking at everything uh looking at you know all the factors what happened back then what's happening now and and i think we would be remiss if we just didn't try to consider everything and make the best possible decision uh, under the law Well, I, I appreciate that approach, but I say I, you know, I bring this up because there could be instances, because I believe there have been instances before the court in the past, where you are essentially put in a position to determine whether something is an authentically Hawaiian enough process or behavior that it's deserving of constitutional protection, and that's a that's an issue that the legislature has, I believe, historically taken pains to avoid. Uh, right or wrong, and so certainly in the past, and I think inevitably during your tenure, if you are confirmed, you might as well you you may as well be put in that position. And so I think it's a fair question to ask on how you would approach a scenario like that. Oh, it certainly is a fair question, um, and I. I, th I thought I'd try to explain to you my uh, my approach, which is just sort of uh, let's look at everything, everything on the record, you know, whatever is presented there to the court, and then whatever is presented in the body of Hawaii Supreme Court case law, um, and then basically trying to reach uh, a reasoned judgment. So it's a general approach, but I think that's the only real um answer that I can give you here at, at this point on, on, on those issues. You know, if the legislature speaks on something, 
hey, we follow we follow that unless there's some sort of ambiguity. Um, but for the most part, I think many of these issues, it's just a matter of just taking a hard look at what's on the record and what's been presented and what's in the past and what's in the present and just trying to reach a sensible, rational balance and a reasoned decision. Well, perhaps then, in fairness, that was more of a statement than a question, but I appreciate your understanding and your answer. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Members, any other questions? Yeah, I just get one, one, one more follow-up. Um, sorry, because I just want to be correct, because you know, I'm kind of new at this. So the position right now that we're referring that the governor's message one is to be sitting on the Supreme Court um, bench, right? This is, he's going to be a judge on the Supreme Court? Is that is that the nomination for his position? I'm sorry, for, for Judge Eddins? Yeah, his, his position yeah, he's he, going for is for the Supreme Court judge, right? right. So justice, but yes, on yeah, the justice. Supreme Court. Sorry, I'm sorry, justice. Okay, the only reason why I'm asking this question is because when the grand jury, I, I don't keep chewing on this back and forth, but it, it's very hard for me. I just share with you and I share with the people out there. It's hard for me, not because um, I always relate everything to my family and people in my family, but my daughter is 16 years old. And just this thing just playing in my head. So I, the question that I have, when the grand jury indicted this case and said it had enough evidence to go to trial, the guy got arrested going forward. At the end of the day, after you got it, after four years or so-called whatever, the continuancing. Um, at the end of the day, um, the guy didn't serve time. And then, on top of all of that, he didn't even have to s register as a sex offender. So maybe he never have enough evidence um, at the time presented to you to the point that maybe he could prove that he did the act. But the grand jury found it enough of, of evidence to find out that he was he was actually a sex offender. Uh, whether he was found guilty or served time, he should at least minimum be able to have registered as a sex offender. And that that is something that maybe I, I don't know too much about at all how how the thing had happened. But that's something that I, I, I would wanted to ask. Now I would have asked you that if I got to see you in person and um, maybe got the answer but um, it was just bothering me, and I had to take some time to think on how I was going to present it. But this is really bothering me that he didn't serve time, and he didn't even get to have to register as a sex offender. But the grand jury found enough evidence to afford, and the four years of delay, and whatever they would present, and however it would land on your lap, and how it had happened to have the, um, the process the way it happened in your court. Um, I, I just wanted to know, how, how did we come to that? How, how did we, um, without in all the details, how did we come to the fact that he didn't serve no jail time, and then he didn't serve as a sex offender? You have to register. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think what you're talking about is a probable cause determination. There's various mechanisms in which a case can be uh, injected into the to the system. One is through a grand jury indictment, where a grand jury finds probable cause. It's a one-sided proceeding uh, in which only the prosecution is there, and they present evidence to the grand jury, and the grand jury uh, makes a determination as to whether there's probable cause. Um, um, so that's the standard uh, in which somebody can get charged. As far as the plea agreement in this case, is the plea agreement uh, entered into between the prosecution and the defense um, was not a sexual uh, uh, offense that uh, required the individual, the defendant, to register as a sex offender. So that's why that individual is not registered as a sex offender. The plea agreement also provided a, um, a probation deal. Um, so, you know, we as judges, we sentence dozens, you know, and maybe I've sentenced over 100 child sex cases, you know, over, over the years, mostly based on plea agreements uh, entered into uh, by the parties. I think you're, and I don't know if you were here when I, I made the comment, I think we're hard pressed to find anybody 
who doesn't have your sentiment. And in fact, when we pick jurors on these types of very sensitive cases, we have the extra large panels because many people can't sit on these types of trials. But what's really important is this, is our criminal justice system, an individual's presumed innocent unless residents of Oahu, citizens of the United States, find that individual guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's hard to get jurors in this case, but in, in many of the jurors who come in, they have the exact same sentiments uh, as yourself. Um, but we have to get jurors who are pro-fairness, who will set aside their preconceived ideas and just decide the case on the facts and the law. And that's really what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in our criminal uh, justice system. That's proof beyond a reasonable doubt versus uh, simply a probable cause standard to, to charge uh, somebody. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. thank you for that, uh, um, for making me understand. And then the, the other part was when the continuance was asked by the prosecutor, um, you were saying earlier that um, you didn't really think that the person that it was trying to bring into, that was out of town um, to come and testify, but Again, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm reading over here was that the person that was out of town was the doctor that was going to be defense on the rape kit that was completed that had DNA or evidence to the fact that the person that did, um, in fact, was accused um, had evidence um, um, with, the, uh, the, with the rape kit. And that, that was the person that um, they said that was waiting, that was out of town, and then um, you, you didn't allow uh, the continuance um, for that person to come in and testify. Is, is that the same same situation or was there was another one they had asked? I'm not sure, Senator, what the precise factual scenario on those decisions. You know, I make thousands, not tens of thousands of discretionary um, uh, decisions on procedure, on evidence. I, 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 you know, I can't recollect precisely what happened under that scenario although i will say this is most judges especially me disfavor any type of a continuance at the last minute particularly on a case that's been set for trial for a very very long time that's firm um and you know i i'm, I'm not sure about the nuances I, I just can't speak clearly to them i can't speak clearly to the fact that i adhere to a binding rule 11 plea agreement entered into by the prosecution, placed on the record multiple times with the consent of the victim's mother, and that's what happened in that case. And again, you know, people walk out of the courtroom in our adversarial judicial system um, with, with sometimes very, very wounded feelings, and I perfectly understand that. But we just try to do our best on to ensure that justice happens and that the court business occurs in an efficient and orderly uh, manner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Judge Eddins. The, uh, the vote at the committee will be, as I think I mentioned before, on Wednesday, that's November 8, 18, sorry, at 10.30 a.m. on Zoom and in room 016. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and we will move on to the other um, judge that we have before, uh, um, appointee that we have before us today, that is Judiciary Communication number one, and I have no idea why my video just stopped. Uh, can you put me back on, please? Chair, we can still hear you. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. So for Stephanie Char R.S. Char for a term to expire in six years for the District Family Court of the Fifth Circuit, which is Kauai. Uh, first up on this one, we have Alan Komagome in support. Actually, all the testimony except from the Hawaii State Bar Association is in support, and they have comments. Allison Tom, Clifford Nakea, David Hayakawa, Edward Aquino, Grant Gaventer, Jackie Esser, J.C. Yoon, James Rouse, James Tabe, Marissa Agena, uh, Okia Amadi, Selena Kanai, Matt Friedman, Stephen Nichols, 
Chairman Tomasa, Timothy Ho, Warren Sato, William Bagasol, and William M. Gibson and Gwendolyn Gibson, and Christian Enright, all in support. Uh, we will try to see if, uh, let, let's take a quick break here again. Uh, let's come back in four minutes at 345 and quick break and we'll just a, a recess and we'll see if we can get um, Mr. Fry on. So a recess for till 345.
from Ms. Char, and that's Gregory Fry with Y State Bar Association. He was going to try to get hooked back in from a different location, but I do not see his name. So, uh, so he had comments uh, for those who haven't had a chance to read that testimony. Uh, the Y State Bar Association did qual uh, did give Ms. Char the qualified um, uh, the qualified standing. So, uh, I think. And we already heard the the process that they went through for the for Judge Eddins. So I think at this point we can go ahead and have Ms. Char make an opening statement if you'd like. Sorry it took so long. I knew it would take a while. I wasn't really expecting it to take this long. Go ahead. No problem. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senators. Uh, this judicial position has been direly needed in our circuit. I would very much like to be the person to shoulder the responsibility of filling this position if given the opportunity to do so. As a public defender, we work this job because at our core, we care about people. People who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, people who uh, might be suffering from mental health or substance abuse issues, people who have made wrong criminal choices in their life, find themselves in the system and are now working to either better their lives or working to repair the damage done as a result of those decisions. And this part of me at my core, I feel would do well to transition into the family court system. I've reached a point in my career where I would like to move beyond serving the public in my limited capacity as a public defender. And I believe as a family court judge, I would be able to serve a bigger section of our community here on Kauai. I know the work will be difficult, but I'm not afraid of a challenge and I look forward to meeting this head on. Burning the midnight oil will be something that is required of me to bring and maintain integrity and respect to this position. Briefly, my background, my father was from the island of Oahu, my mom from the island of Kauai. I was born in California. Um, while I was still an infant, my parents moved back to Kauai as they wanted to uh, raise me here on the island. I went to Kapa'a school from kindergarten to 12th grade, participated in many extracurricular activities growing up, both through school and outside of school, and made lifelong friends from all walks of life. In 2003, I found myself working at the public defender's office on the island of Oahu. Uh, where I remained till 2011 when a position opened up here on Kauai. And at that point, it was just time to move back home. So now, along with my husband and our two children, we're fortunate, we are very fortunate to be raising them here on Kauai. This place and its people, I care deeply about. I want to thank everyone, my friends, family, my colleagues who have supported me this far and gotten me to this point. I want to thank Chief Justice Rechtenwald uh, for the consideration of my appointment. And I want to thank you, Senators, for giving me the opportunity to make these remarks. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, questions? Uh, I don't see anybody right off the bat, so I'll start. And if other members uh, want to jump in, please do. Do you anticipate any challenges uh, with transitioning from an advocacy role to being a judge? It's, you've been in the public defender's office for a while. This is going to be a different, uh, different position. I, I don't see any challenges. I mean, I think it's enough that you have to recognize the difference between being an advocate and a judge. As a judge, I think my role is more of a decision maker. Um, as an advocate, my role is getting that judge to rule in my favor. And you just have to, you know, quite frankly, if, if this is a job I'm gonna be given the opportunity to do, you gotta take off that advocate hat and put on the judicial hat. Senator, you're muted. Sorry about that, I don't know how that happened. Because uh, I didn't touch the computer. <laughs> how would you describe your, act, your intended approach to cases where the defendant appears to have a mental health or substance abuse condition that impacts their decision-making ability? I think, 
first and foremost, my as as a general rule, I suppose, first and foremost, my inclination, whether it be mental health issues or substance abuse issues, would be to look towards treatment. Um, of course, you have to take into a lot of different considerations. For example, the, the reason the person's before you, the reason you know you're dealing with this case, um, you know, if it's something some kind of high level violent felony crime that the person is before you for, and it's a substance abuse issue, treatment might not be the answer. But I think as a general rule, I would look towards treatment, look towards, um, uh, like we had discussed, the um, assisted community treatment, the ACT uh, program, guardianship, involuntary commitment hearings, that's always around here. I think the problem with our island, however, is that we have very limited resources in terms of substance abuse treatment, in terms of mental health treatment, um, very limited resources in terms of residential type treatments, both mental health and um, substance abuse. But first and foremost, my approach would be to look towards treatment. I'm sorry, you're muted again, Senator. <laughs> I'm raising my hands and I, don't, I, didn't, touch the, I didn't touch anything. So um, with regard to uh, assisted community treatment and uh, involuntary commitments, guardianships, all that stuff does come before the family court. So you probably will have uh, an opportunity to is that special calendar stuff. Um, I, how do I phrase the question? Do you do you have do you think there are, are you aware of any constitutional issues with any of those laws, either involuntary commitment, ACT, or guardianships? Um, I think for involuntary commitment hearings, there are procedures put in place to protect constitutional rights of um, those clients coming before the court. There's hearings that must be held and findings that a court must make testimony that is taken before a court can involuntarily uh, commit an individual. We don't see that much of assisted community treatment here. Um, but you know, my understanding with that is to a certain degree, a court can order a person um, not committed, but short of being committed to follow through with mental health treatment or to um, take their medication to meet routinely with a caseworker. Um, I, I don't know at what point a court would reach that decision or render that decision and order the person to follow through, but I would hope that the person was at least maybe appointed a guardian um, a legal guardian, you know, if we're looking at mental health issues, if that person can't follow um, treatment orders or is not following tr through with treatment orders because of their mental health condition, it's kind of a catch-22, I suppose, but... but you, you as a judge will, I believe you'll have the authority to appoint a guardian. Yes, life. absolutely, absolutely, and, and that's would, how guardians... And you would exercise that right in that situation? I would. Okay. If okay. I felt the need, I mean, you know, it was necessary. Okay. Okay. Um, members, any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Senator Kim, is that Joy, I'm going to defer to Joy. Oh, okay. Senator Tim Wendem and Tour, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so, um, Ms. Char, um, yes. when I talked to you last, um, prior to this hearing, you said that you will likely, because there's another family court judge there, um, you will likely be appointed to like the divorce or the civil calendar rather than the criminal calendar because of the conflict of interest in the fact that you have, are a public defender now. How long will you have that conflict of interest? My understanding um, is that it's a two-year moratorium. If I'm given the opportunity for this position, I will not be able to touch any type of criminal cases for two years. Okay, so when, when Chair Rhodes talked about ACT or um, mental illness, 
basically what, when you're talking about FCCR, and for those who don't practice, that's a family court criminal proceedings, you won't be able to hear those type of cases for two years, right? Correct. Okay, so, and I think I told you this before, because I've been in practice in family court here in Hilo for over 10 years, and I, and I already told you my personal experience, like the worst family court judge I had was a public defender, because they had like no idea how to do divorce cases. And in the state of Hawaii, unlike California, where you and I were educated, where it's a community property state and the statute says what a division is in Hawaii, property division is all case oriented. Um, how, do you, how do you propose? Because like I said, um, for those of us who have to deal with you, and not me, but you know, attorneys in Lihue in Kauai who have to do civil cases in front of you and you have no experience doing civil cases, how do you propose that you quickly learn how to do divorce cases? I mean, it's a question of education. I have to educate myself, period, plain and simple. Um, I would never, if I take the bench, presume to know that I know any more about divorce law than I actually do. Um, I would never, you know, I pride myself on preparation. Um, and I think, you know, to avoid situations that you found yourself in practicing before that particular judge, I think it's irresponsible to take the bench and not know um, the law that you're, you're the type of case, the law governing the type of case you're presiding over. Um, like I said, you know, this is going to be a matter of burning the midnight oil. And it's, it's necessary to bring integrity and respect to this position and to maintain that integrity and that respect. And so I'm ready for the hard work. Um, I've already reached out to our family court judge here just, you know, to ask him some questions about what, how can I expect some of these cases to proceed? Um, I reached out to some of the family court practitioners here to ask them what their experience was in divorce cases, child custody cases, TRO cases. So it's a matter of educating myself, not being lazy about doing it and preparing my calendar every day so that I am keenly aware of what issues um, you know, I might be called upon to decide. Okay, and, and I thank you. And I only have a couple more cases, I mean, more questions, Chair. Um, in that regard, uh, will, you, will you have a commitment to practicing attorneys that you will be decisive and not take over two years like the prior public defender turned family court judge to make a decision on his first divorce case. You know, absolutely. And when we talked about this, what I told you is, you know, when there are delays like that, that substantial, or I mean, delays in general, you got to think about the unheard from parties that those delays affect. You know, if you're dealing with a divorce and, and a decision takes a year, a year and a half, to be made, you know, you got to be mindful that there might be children in, you know, at issue in this divorce, and, and that delay can greatly affect these children. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, I'm hoping that you decide to, when you make a decision, because you are a judge versus being an advocate, you actually make a decision within one year. The other thing is, what I wanted to point out was the last like Hilo is, has a small family court system, just like Kauai, okay? And the last female family court judge here, as I pointed out to you, uh, basically was not allowed to finish her term. And I can't, couldn't quite figure out from the chief court, I mean, from the chief justice what happened. So my question to you is, will you have a, com and my concern as a legislator, when we're looking at a $2 billion possible deficit and that we continue to pay benefits and salary for a family court judge that is not sitting and we end up having to pay for a 
substitute family court judge that in the event that there is a untenable conflict that the judiciary for some reason says you cannot sit continue to sit as a family court judge for an indefinite period can you commit to us that you will resign so that we can actually hire another family court judge instead of being in limbo for over a year uh i, I or is what you're asking me if i'm appointed yes if somewhere down the road something happens where i am asked to like leave the bench or you know i'm i my uh, tenure has ended before the six years are up. Are you asking me if I am gi giving you a commitment that I will resign or quit? Okay, let me, let me explain the scenario. So the last family court judge here in Hilo, who was female, was not allowed to finish her term. She was basically asked by the Chief Justice, as well as the judiciary, to not sit as a family court judge. We don't know why um, she just was not allowed to sit, but her salary continued, her benefits continued. Family court attorneys in Hilo were confused because especially with child custody cases, you, you really need a judge who knows the history in order to be able to make decisions now as to like whether or not custody changes or visitation changes but because but because this attorney this judge was not allowed to sit they had to bring in substitute judges and you know what per diem judges mm -hmm. are they just come in for the day that's what they're called per diem by the day so they don't know the history and so and it was over a year and i guess the concern as taxpayers why are we paying for a family court judge at 169,000 per or so per year with benefits when and the substitute judges when th that family court judge cannot even do her job so my um, question is in the event and it took over a year in the event it took like for some reason that there is this irreconcilable conflict that you cannot do your job will you commit to resigning well first of all i i don't foresee that situation happening well, if given good. the opportunity um secondly it that's a really hard question to answer i mean i'm a reasonable person i have been practicing law my entire professional career um especially going into the family court section where so much is at stake for so many different people i wouldn't want i mean you know I, I i would have to know the circumstances but i wouldn't have like any kind of stubbornness stand in the way of blocking up the system and blocking up the the the, the, the case law you know the cases from moving through the system again it, there's just so much at stake in the family court sector that to have it stalled for an entire year because of my decision, I think is a selfish decision. And, and I don't know that I can tell you I will commit because I don't you know, know what kind of circumstances might be surrounding that situation. But I can tell you um, that I'm reasonable, uh, I'm not selfish, and this is a position that I, care deeply about, and I wouldn't want to create a backlog. Thank you. And okay. um, yeah, I, I have no further question. OK, thank you. Uh, I think Senator Kim, did you have a question? Yeah, just for the record, I want to uh, thank, thank you very much, um, Ms. Char. And I certainly enjoyed uh, talking with you. I just wanted to um, once again have you uh, for everyone else just to um, say your position on uh, 
setting policy from the bench. I try to ask this question to all our judges so that there's some kind of, hopefully, some consistency as we go along. Because uh, we've had issues where, you know, judges want to not just interpret our laws, but uh, try to set policy from time to time. So uh, if that event happens, what would be your position? I, I don't believe it's a, the judiciary's role to create policy, uh, period. I think the ju judiciary's role is, among other things, to interpret the law. And sometimes the way the law is written, it's elastic enough that different judges could interpret one statute or one piece of law in two different ways. Um, but I don't think it's the court's position to create policy. In the, in the event a case comes before you where you find in favor of the plaintiff in a sense of um, <clears throat> an issue with, against the state for um, <clears throat> certain kinds of monies that they should be receiving, do you think it's appropriate for the court to determine what that amount should be? If, if a case should come before me where I find for the plaintiff wherein that the, that the legislature didn't provide enough funding that there's, there's a question on the on the amount of funding that they should be receiving um and you found yes that in fact that we should be giving you more money is it appropriate for the courts to determine how much that money should be that amount and this be? is this is without the legislature issuing any kind of law to the contrary like uh, like putting a cap on the amount of funds or putting a range on the amount of funds. Yes, we have a certain amount already in the budget. Uh, entity feels that's not enough. They they come to court. Judge agrees that it, is it appropriate for the for the courts to determine what that amount would be in your opinion? I I you know, I'd have to look at the particular law we're dealing with. Um, I think so long as a judge rendering an amount to be paid does not step outside of the bounds of whatever law is controlling the case, I think that's all right. But if it's a budgetary item, isn't that um, the purview of the legislature and not the courts? So if it's a budgetary issue wherein the legislature has already set some kind of formula or set some kind of uh, scheme, monetary scheme, I don't know that the judge, you know, short of some kind of creative interpretation of the law, I don't know that the judge can overstep that boundary. Okay. Well, it did happen, so that's why I bring that up. actual practicing as a public defender? Yeah, practicing and on, on the people that were released. Um, I can't speak for the other circuits, but I do know that in our circuit, um, I believe it was the second round of orders that came out that allowed public, public safety to, um, there was discussion between the prosecuting attorney's office, our main public defender's office, and public safety. Um, but there were a number of um, orders that, that, that allowed inmates to be released. Um, majority of these inmates were public defender clients, and the effect that it caused, at least in our circuit, um, some of those clients 
were released without us having um, any contact information for, uh, were released, and we oftentimes didn't know about it. You know, they were released at all hours of the day, um, and we weren't notified about it until after the fact. So, you know, to a certain degree, it caused a little bit of chaos here um, because of just how all these releases happen one after the other and kind of in mass, you know? Um, some people after being released didn't show up for their next court dates. Um, we had the COVID thing uh, still, I mean, well, it's still going on, but you know, our courthouses, our probation departments, everything was um, really like skeletal crew, crew. So these people weren't checking in with their probation officers weren't notified of their court date, court date. So it, it did cause a little bit of chaos, but it effectively reduced the population of our uh, facility here. Was that um, experience um, shared with the judiciary, shared with the um, um, CJ as to, you know, what occurred to that? If there's a second round of this, is that my... I, I personally did not share it with anyone i mean other than my coworkers, when we discuss on how we can best get a hold of our clients or you know prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future so do you think that though that kind of information should be shared with the judiciary so that uh the judiciary understanding the causes and what happened would then improve that should we have something like that happen again in the future you know i think any information as a result of anything that happened because of these emergency orders should definitely be shared with the judiciary. Um, if there are any holes in the process, should this have to happen again, they might be able to be plugged up, you know, with the sharing of this information. But so do you intend to share that? Uh, me personally, I, I didn't have an intent to share it, but I can certainly talk with my supervisors at the Oahu office and discuss how they would like to proceed with that. Okay, well, I hope you will um, take it upon yourself to share that um, with the CJ uh, when you have that opportunity, because I think it's important for them to understand what happens in practice. It's sort of like us, we pass laws sometimes, and you know, we don't realize what the, what the effect of it is, and then when it goes into effect, uh, we have to come back in and either repeal something or amend it, uh, because you know there's unintended consequences and so I, I think the same thing happens in the judiciary so certainly would appreciate um, uh, and that your former colleagues in in on in the prosecutor not prosecutor's office but in the public defender's office would also maybe share their experience as well so thank you very much yes members any other questions Senator Keo Kololoi Senator Gabbard Uh, Mr. sure, go ahead. So, um, thank you very much. I don't know what happened to my mic. Okay. So, um, one of my concerns, and and I and I've addressed this with you, and I guess I just want to, I just want a commitment. It's um, again, I'm looking at it from a practicing attorney's point of view. Um, about we've had um, when two female judges were originally appointed here to Hilo. They were far more difficult um, with female attorneys than they were with male attorneys. And um, complaints were made. And I guess my, my request to you, and, and women have a tendency to be harder with other women, would be, um, would you commit to equal treatment and to check yourself whenever there is a potential of your judicial temperament um, being in question. Um, absolutely. I think that kind of behavior is irresponsible. It's unprofessional. Unprofessional. Uh, not only does it have no place in the courtroom, it has no place anywhere whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely commit to that. Thank you very much. I have nothing further, Chair Rhodes. Thank you. Members, any other questions? I get one. Senator Favela. Uh, my mind is uh, 
creative um, and legal. I'm not, I'm not an attorney, sorry. But I'm going to try my best. <clears throat> going to um, your background on um, why uh, <clears throat> you decided to become an attorney. Can, can you share that a little bit with us? Why I, why I decided to become an attorney? Yes. I... <laughs> I mean, to be blunt, I kind of fell into it. Um, after I finished uh, receiving my master's in philosophy, I was very interested in pursuing a career in philosophy. Most likely that would be some kind of uh, teaching career, possibly on a collegiate level. When I spoke to my philosophy professors about what that exactly entailed, I became a bit discouraged. Um, I had taken a couple of philosophy of law classes throughout my philosophy schooling. Um, and it was just something about the law. I mean, it was a different approach to law and to legal issues, but it was something that really piqued my interest. Um, so at that point, you know, I kind of mixed the uh, philosophy career and I looked into what it took to, um, to get a law degree. I went ahead and took the LSAT and got myself into law school. And then, um, the only reason why I'm asking some of these questions, I know I talked to you earlier today, and um, uh, it, it, I mean this morning, and it was it was a very um, awesome conversation, knowing that, you know, um, I shared that with you going away to college and then even coming back to Oahu to go back to your hometown. Um, you know, a, a lot of people that Go, go to being attorneys and um, having the kind of uh, uh, resume that you have, usually don't come back um, to the islands. And then we glad and we welcome um, um, you um, doing what you're doing and um, continuing on. Because you know some of the questions I was hearing asked, um, the reason why I asked that is because some of the questions asked, if, if you read or you look at your resume and your background, you have a diverse background that you have, um, even the volunteering as a coach uh, with your husband, um, knowing because um, you know your children wouldn't have, or your child at the time wouldn't have had to be able to participate in sports, so you guys decided to step up. Just that diverse background that you have. Um, for me, um, I'm not a I'm not a um, attorney or a judge, but just just my my personal view is that you know I I think you're gonna do Kauai uh, a great on the family court judge just knowing your family background and coming back to the beautiful island um, that my family uh, lives on that I never got to grow up in. But just spending some time up there, just knowing that, and knowing that you'd be successful in, in uh, serving the people of Hawaii and Kauai. So thank you for that. Thank you for coming thank back. Thank you, Senator. Okay, members, any other, any other lines of questioning? If not, thank you for your appearance today. Uh, just a reminder that the vote uh, at the committee will be uh, on Wednesday, November 18, 1030 AM uh, on Zoom and in 06, 01, room 016. And I think we are completed and we will, I guess, technically recess until uh, Wednesday at 11, I'm sorry, Wednesday at 1030, 1030. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks for thank being you. here. We'll see you, see you soon. Take care.